Good afternoon. I am Chandan Raika from Department of Media Studies, School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Rewa University. And I will be your host for today's symposium on national education policy and media education in India, challenges and opportunities. Rewa University is one of the best private university spread over 45 acres of lush green land built with the state of art infrastructure offering 33 full-time undergraduate courses and 24 full-time postgraduate courses with excellent facilities to have complete learning experience. The courses are designed, to, uh, designed uniquely to give importance to both academic and skill-based education to create a bright future for students. Our chancellor, Dr. P. Shamraju, is an educationist and philanthropist who aims to bring change to the society by bringing the means of education to every sector of society. And our vice chancellor, Dr. Dhananjay, aims to make our students great thinkers and work towards developing a holistic atmosphere for education. Can we please have the corporate AV screen now? The future is always indefinite, complex, scary, and changing. Every aspect is now moving at a faster rate than ever. Be it education, entertainment, work, technology, and even lifestyle. Making it harder to predict of what is to come every day, every minute, and every second. And this is why we need the young minds to absorb the right information, creating a new breed of world-class engineers trained to design the next big thing. Artistic architects who understand the need for sustainability and the much-needed socially responsible lawmakers. Let's not forget the brilliant graduates of commerce, science and technology, management and arts. But where? Reva University is your answer. A place where young minds collide with superior knowledge, creating a superior mark in the private university space with unique educational methods based on experiential learning and knowledge exchange through interactive sessions. Also, providing you with the opportunity to switch to a desired curriculum and interdisciplinary studies of your choice at any time. A broad spectrum of extracurricular activities like sports, dance, various clubs and so on are available for you to pursue. Not just that, Reva also promises a fantastic university experience with a calm, peaceful and diverse campus encouraging students from all over the world with state-of-the-art laboratories, latest sports facilities, well-equipped media centers, a library that fulfills its tag as an extensive knowledge bank and hostels that make you feel at home with tasty food that's nutritious. The future is now easier with the light from some of the best minds and with friendships that last a lifetime. You now have the power to choose an outstanding future. University, one association for many great careers. Education is the fundamental element for achieving full human potential and a just society. 
as a developing country, we, uh, it is necessary that we need to provide access to high quality education. And that is the best way forward for maximizing our country's rich talents for the good of the society and country. In the last few years, we have evidenced the world going through a rapid change in the knowledge landscape with technological advancements like big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Many jobs have been taken over by machines, but the demand for multidisciplinary abilities and skills across social science and humanities will be of great demand in the near future. Today, we are privileged to have scholars, authors, and experienced academicians from different parts of the country who have agreed to spend their precious time and knowledge in discussing the various challenges that we are yet to face in the practice of media education and also enlighten us about the opportunities that will help us to grow as a nation. Today's session will be moderated by Dr. Sapna Nayak. Dr. Sapna is an associate professor at Department of Studies in Journalism and Communication at University of Mysore. She's known for her contributions in the academia with over 40 publications in reputed international and national journals. She's a proud recipient of several awards, one of them being Best Media Educator 2018. Her interest and passion lies towards, uh, lies towards media, which made her a regular contributor for the national dailies. She has recently authored a book titled Corporate Communication. She also received an Indo-Sri Lankan fellowship and has contributed extensively for upgrading the syllabus for media education in Sri Lanka. Ma'am, it's an honor to have you moderate this session. The session is all yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Chandan, uh, for such an uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon, one and all, uh, the panelists, uh, the attendees who are being, attending this uh, national symposium on uh, uh, national education policy and media education in India, challenges and opportunities. It's my really, it's my privilege to be a part and also be a moderator of this particular session. So we have a huge list of distinguished experience and uh, experienced panelists uh, among us who will be discussing more on the particular issue. But before we set on, I would just like to set the tone for the particular day. First and foremost thing is the panelists will be speaking for 15 minutes duration on the topic which has been assigned to them. The second thing is the question and answers would be taken at the end of this session. That is when all the panelists are done with their presentation, the question and answer session would be taken up. So we, as I told you, we have a very distinguished and experienced panelist among us. It is my proud privilege to introduce you all, but this will be a very brief introduction. As and in when the panelists come, I'll be introducing more on their bio as well as their experience. Today we have with us Professor K.T. Suresh, Suresh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Markan Lal Chaturvedi National University of Journalism Communication uh, and Communication from Bhopal. Sir, heartily welcome you, sir. We also have Professor Purnananda, Professor with Koempu University in Shumaga, our uh, beloved teacher also. We have Dr. Sanjeev uh, HOD, Journalism uh, Department from Malinivals College, Tirunantapuram. We have Professor Nandini Lakshmikanta, Professor from School of Communication, Manipal University. We have also been joined by Professor Seema Sangra, who is the Program Leader, Media Studies Department, Amity University, Dubai. And also Dr. Mohammed Anif, Assistant Professor, Department of Mass Communication, Pondicherry University. Above all, we also have Professor R. Kar Karapaga Kumar Ravel, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Central University of Tamil Nadu, who will be giving away with the keynote uh, address. Before we start the session, let me, get, uh, let me keep the ball rolling. The first and the foremost thing when we speak of media education or when we speak of the national education policy, as my friend already told, is there has been a lot of changes or I should say a lot of rapid changes which has been happening in the knowledge landscape. But education has been always been one of the proud privilege at the same time a fundamental thing which is very much needed for the development of human. When you speak of education, there has been a sea change, whether in terms of science and technology, whether it can be knowledge or it can be any kind of advancement. There has been a lot of change which has happened. So education should be done in such a way that it's not only about a degree, it is about a kind of knowledge what you're trying to impart to the students because all these education has to lead to something related to scientific development, 
it can be related to social justice and equality or it can be even related to the cultural uh, uh, pre preservations and all so when we go back to the sdg that is the sustainable development goal of the un which said that the global education development agenda which is reflected in the uh, sdg 4 which says uh, according to 2030 Though we have adopted the policy in the year 2015 in India, which says ensure inclusive as well as equitable quality education so that we can promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. And there is also there is a very huge need for us to uh, reconfigure the things and also see how this foster learning, especially in the higher education level, can make us more critical at the same time, which will also help us to achieve certain goals. When I speak of education, especially the media education, we have undergone a lot of changes. When I say education, there is a lot of things, especially when it comes to the employment landscape, as well as when you look into the global arena, there has been a lot of changes which you can see. Education should be something which we feel that has to be more of a less content because it has to be more about learning. At the same time, we should see whether this education, what we are trying to provide at the higher education level has made us more critical as more as uh, made us more problem solving because this is what is the thing which we are trying to look for whether this education what we are imparting has become more creative whether it is more interdisciplinary or i should call it as a multidisciplinary whether the education what we are imparting as something to deal with innovation or something to related to whether it is adoptable at the same time whether as it made the students much more observant in the new material at the same time, the pedagogy also, when you look into the teaching arena, when you look into the teaching side of the thing, there has been a lot of changes. The experimental things have been taken up. So we are expecting a kind of experiential learning. We speak of holistic approach. We speak about integration. We speak about student centric. We speak about something which has to be more of a discussion based as well as it has to be flexible. But end of the day, what we are expecting is whether the teaching, what we are doing is enjoyable for the students. So keeping all these things in mind, we have this panel of people who will be uh, will be giving you more light on how the things has to be done in the uh, education of media. It can be research, it can be pedagogy, it can be research. So with all these things, I heartily welcome our keynote address uh, speaker of the day today to take over. So now I call upon Professor R. Karapaga Kumaraval, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Uni Central University of Tamil Nadu to give away the keynote address. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Beloved coordinator from the reputed Reva University. Dear colleagues from Reva University. And my beloved counterpart, Vice Chancellor of National University of Journalism and Communication, Bhopal, Professor K.J. Suresh. Dr. Purnananda from Kompe University, Professor Sapna from Mysore University, Dr. Sanjeev from Thiruvananthapuram, Professor Seema from Amity University, Dubai, Dr. Nandini from Manipal University, and Dr. Mohammed Hanif from Pondicherry University, and my own colleague from Central University of Tamil Nadu, Dr. Shyamala, on whose behalf I have joined this meeting. Dignitaries, delegates, participants, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to associate myself with the very significant, very relevant, very right program, a national symposium on national education policy and media in education challenges and opportunities. At the outset, I would like to congratulate the organizers for organizing a right program at the right time on a very right topic. And as you know, Indian higher education system is one of the oldest, biggest higher education system in the world. Indian higher education system is the second biggest in terms of number of students and the third biggest higher education system in terms of number of institutions in the world. Next only to 
American higher education system. And as you know, the great Chinese scholar, Yuan Suang, he came all along the way from China to India long back. And he was in India for a long period of 17 years to learn the Indian higher education system. So that way we have inherited a glorious past. We had world renowned universities. Nalan. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah, you're audible. Ah. We have world renowned universities like Nalanda University, Dachasila University, Ujjain University, Kanji University. So all these things, in spite of such a glorious past, it is a very unfortunate trend. So it's muted. It's mute. Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. sir. So it is very unfortunate that in spite of being one of the oldest higher education systems in the world, in spite of being one of the biggest higher education systems in the world, Indian universities could not figure in top 100 in the global ranking. So what ails our Indian higher education system? And there comes the solution in the name of National Policy and Education 2020. Let me give you a historical perspective of the national policies in India. Historically, after independence, we had the report of Dr. Radhakrishnan's University Education Commission in the year 1948-49. Then the report from the then Vice Chancellor of University of Madras, Dr. Lashimna Sami Mudaliyar's Secondary Education Commission in 1952-53. Then the report from the then chairman of UGC, Dr. D.S. Kothari, known as Education Commission Report in 1964-66. Then the National Policy and Education 1968. It was the first national policy on education in the year 1968 which is the development of Dr. Kothari's Education Commission report. And then the 42nd Constitutional Amendment, 1976, and then education was placed in the concurrent list. Then we had the National Policy and Education in the year 1986. So the National Policy and Education 1986 got modified in 1992 through program of action. Then we have the recent TSR Subramaniam Committee report on 27th May 2016 and the present New Education Policy 2020 report of the nine member team led by the former Chief of ISRO, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, who submitted the monumental report on 31st May 2019, which underwent a wide concentration process online and offline. So the National Policy and Education 2020, which is now called as New Education Policy, yeah, the New Education Policy document running to 65 pages in its opening line has very rightly observed education is fundamental for achieving full human potential, developing an equitable and just society and promoting national development. It sets the stage on the vision and mission of the policy. I don't want to take much of your precious time because we have very eminent experts who are going to deliberate on the various dimensions of a media in the light of national policy and education. Still, I would like to highlight a few significant features of the national policy and education 2020. The loftier goal to bring two crore out of school children into the school system, thereby attempting to reduce school dropouts. Students will be much more empowered and have the opportunity to choose the subjects they wish to learn, thanks to the flexibility suggested in the 
national policy and education. And then improving governance by bringing in a single regulator to look after all institutions except medical and law colleges. A flip to holistic education by envisioning the convergence of science and art streams. So focus on ethics and human and constitutional values, which will go a long way in the creation of an enlightened citizenship, essential for deepening our democratic roots. Then the expanding the scope of fundamental basic education, foundation education, increasing the school going years from 3 to 18 instead of the prevalent 6 to 14, which will enable a more holistic development of children in the formative age group of 3 to 6 years. Provision for an energy filled breakfast in addition to the nutritious midday meal to help children achieve better learning outcomes. The medium of instruction until at least fifth grade, preferably eighth grade, will be in a regional language. Coming to the focus of this uh, webinar, media and technology will be leveraged to strengthen and even undertake the above initiatives. So finally, media and technology will be leveraged to strengthen the above initiatives of the national policy and education. Quality technology-based options for adult learning such as apps, online courses, modules, satellite-based TV channels, online books, and ICT-equipped libraries and adult education centers will be encouraged. So the philosophy is, if the mountain does not come to Muhammad, Muhammad should go to mountain. So that way, I am very happy that uh, this program, the National Symposium, is organized on national education policy and media education in India, challenges and opportunities. I would like to congratulate once again the organizers, and I also would like to listen to the deliberations to be made by uh, the dignitaries and the panelists here. And one suggestion I would like to make is you please make a publication, online publication, digital publication, as well as uh, offline publication, so that you should not only generate new knowledge, but also disseminate the new knowledge which you have generated. So because the generation of knowledge and dissemination of knowledge are the two important functions of such a symposia. So with these few words, I take the, I, I take immense delight in thanking the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much on behalf of the Central University of Tamil Nadu. I wish you all a very enjoyable webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Karabaka, Garapaga Kumar Ravel, sir, for uh, letting us know that, as you said, the documentation in India, we always lack in documentation. And these kind of symposium or the deliberations need to be documented so that it can be useful ah, for the future yeah, generation exactly. at the same time for the policy makers in the future. And we were very much uh, delighted to have to hear you, sir, because we know that you have uh, more than 36 years of service, which has been spread across and your experience has been shown the kind of words what you said and just for the uh, attendees who have joined us uh, very uh, just now i would like to inform you that uh, professor sir has been the vice chancellor of madurai kamaraj university and has also made a substantial contribution and the pioneer achievements in the area of institutional building fundraising human resource development infrastructure research promotion as well as curricular uh, reforms administrative reforms so, sir has been contributing a lot because he has been an expert with NCRT in the formulation of national curriculum framework and MHRD in the development of national policy on ICT and school education. Sir has also established a center for educational research center with the financial support of UGC and government of Tamil Nadu. These kind of contribution for the by the expertise and the uh, distinguished uh, professors like him is what the national education policy that is what you can see in the whole of the uh, policy of 20, 2020. So thank you sir for your uh, thank you. Thank remarks you. and now we'll take over. I heartily welcome our panelists. Now the session will begin. Uh, the very first uh, panelist for the day would be our 
uh, Professor K. G. Suresh Sir, who is presently the Vice Chancellor of Makanla Chaturvedi University, Bhopal. Just to brief you about uh, the uh, panelist, as you all know, Professor K. G. Suresh Sir has been a senior journalist and a communication specialist. He is currently serving as the Vice Chancellor of Makanla Chaturvedi National University of Journalism and Communication, Bhopal. He has recently been named uh, for the prestigious Ganesh Shankar Vidyarthi Award for Outstanding Contribution to Journalism by Kendriya uh, in the Hindi Sanstan by the Ministry of HRD, Government of India. Sir has also served as the Director General, Indian Institute of Mass Communication, has been a senior consulting editor with Doordarshan News, has been the founder dean of School of Modern Media, University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, Dehradun. Sir has been involved many of the things I have been hearing, sir, on many of his uh, uh, webinars, which has been conducted from last year on various issues and all. Sir has also been a consulting editor with Doordarshan News, and he has played a very uh, vital role in introducing innovative programs uh, for the Doordarshan. Uh, with his rich professional cross-media experience for more than three decades, Professor Suresh is the recipient of Prem Bhatia Fellowship for Research in Media for Young Journalists. Uh, today, he is here with us and he'll be sharing his thoughts on media education in India, opportunities and challenges. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sapna. Uh, uh, respected uh, Vice Chancellor of the Central University of Tamil Nadu, Professor Karpaga Kumaravel, uh, and uh, my friends from the Riva University, Dr. Chandan, Chandan Raikar uh, and Dr. Manjunathan, and uh, Dr. Shamla from the Central University of Tamil Nadu who has facilitated this uh, interaction uh, for me. My esteemed fellow panelists, uh, you know, I would not like to, because there are uh, eminent panelists here and uh, we would all love to hear all of them. So I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, take all the names here and thus encroach on your valuable time. Uh, but all are known to me and, uh, uh, faculty from the Reva University, research scholars, and all the dear participants. Uh, a very good afternoon and namaskara to all of you. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, compliments to Professor uh, Kumaravel for uh, you know, giving the background, so I need not go back to what the state of education in India is, or that for that matter, what the new education policy is all about. He has already given the uh, background in detail. So I would like to focus on media education straight away. And uh, uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I want to congratulate Reva University because for the last couple of months, all the webinars have been on COVID-19. And, uh, you know, this is a, a refreshing topic after a long time. Because this is one area where we need to talk about because NEP does not specifically the 65 page document does not specifically refer to, uh, you know, uh, media education. Uh, so we have to interpret. And uh, while extending my greetings on behalf of Asia's first media university and in India's biggest and oldest media university, the Makhanlal Chaturvedi National University of Journalism and Communication. Uh, let me also avail this opportunity to announce formally for the first time on any public platform that from the coming academic session itself, as per the NEP norms, our university is going to introduce six UG programs, four-year UG programs as per the new norms of. So this will be our contribution uh, to media education in the sense that as per the NEP norms, we are going to have these courses. Uh, now, let me come to the specifics. You see, as I said, there are no specific recommendations. Unlike many other disciplines which have their own statutory bodies like the Medical Council of India for medical education, the Dental Council of India, dental education, the Bar Council of India for legal education, we don't have any body, statutory body to regulate media education in the country. The consequence is that because we are a professional uh, discipline, the consequence is that there is absolutely no standardization in media education. You have virtually T 
teaching shops which are running from every nook and corner somebody teaching anchoring somebody teaching you know some other camera and other stuff a mojo now the mojo is the trend so you have all kinds of institutions which have come up which have no don't have basic facilities which don't have uh, you know basic curriculum i am not at all in favor of uh, uniformity uh, because we are a diverse country but i am for certain benchmarking certain uh, you know uh, standardization wherein certain facilities have to be ensured certain you know things have to be included in the uh, you know course curriculum for example uh, media law and ethics constitution of india you know i think that these have to be there you cannot be just having a though we have a practical uh, we are a practical oriented discipline i think that equal emphasis should be uh, you know given to the theoretical foundations because only on a very uh, so um, so you need to have very strong theoretical foundation that has to be there now the uh, challenge and opportunity here because uh, time is less so uh, let me try to sum it up as uh, briefly as possible is that uh, you have new avenues coming up you see when i was the director general at indian institute of mass communication we had even set up uh, you know uh, we had even procured land in mumbai for setting up a national center for excellence in animation gaming comics and visual uh, effects and i think that anyway that project has now been given to some other uh, other uh, department but uh, uh, we had even procured uh, you know uh, in mumbai film city now now animation visual effects gaming comics as per the media entertainment skill council there is a and this is also the fiki kpmg report which said that there is a deficit of about 16000 jobs per annum but you don't have skilled manpower now we are most of the universities even today we are only looking at uh print journalism electronic media and maybe to some extent new media when i was at the university of petroleum and energy studies i set up the school of modern media there so but again the focus has been there but are we talking about animation are we talking about visual effects are we talking about uh, you know gaming comics uh, you know robotics the new aspects of journalism today we are looking at a situation where people are not able to move out much and this is the time when i again remember introducing drone journalism at iimc i think that drone using drones and i was very happy to see during the uh, you know annual rath yatra in uh, bhubaneswar i saw uh, many television channels uh, using drones to capture live the uh, you know the rath yatra now these are going to be uh, robotics artificial intelligence internationally this is being done in a big way today the industry let us also you know most of the students let's face it you rightly pointed out uh, dr sapna that you know the the wider canvas of education imparting education is certainly important but let us also face it that in this era of you know paucity of jobs a lot of students are coming because they need jobs they need jobs with good salaries and that has put the pressure on us to ensure that we are today the industry is looking for multitaskers multitasking is the key word today if you are going to prepare groom only print journalists i think that we are doing injustice both to the media industry and to our own students because we see that the print i won't say print will you know be uh, we, we will we, it's early too too early to write the obit of the print industry but uh, print will be there in india for coming some time but the fact is that print has also gone online in a big way you know uh, they have some of the like times internet and all that i mean they have got today you are looking at integrated class, uh, newsrooms so it is important that we do a lot of uh, you know uh, focus on preparing our students uh, as multitaskers so that they are equally at ease uh, doing a mobile journalism doing a uh, you know 
documentary doing uh, you know social media so we have to groom multitaskers so our courses have to be now our success will also depend because you see the focus of this new education national education policy is on uh, interdisciplinarity so a student of science is expected to learn even humanities will we as media educators pick up this challenge and not only ensure that our students get exposed to a lot of science and uh, you know humanities and uh, uh, economics but also to ensure that are we able to prepare capsules for say engineering students say medical students say uh, you know uh, commerce students can we prepare such capsules uh, modules which which would enable them to take media related courses because there is no no industry no aspect of governance which can keep itself away from communication communication is today an integral part of governance so anybody and everybody needs to get an exposure so that that challenge is also before us as media educators that we prepare modules for choice based credit systems which are available for students from other disciplines that is another challenge before us we prepare moocs we prepare you know that is also a big challenge for us then you have ott platforms you are looking at films you know we are going to launch our own film journalism course from my khandwa campus we are going to start you know the basics of journalism village i mean uh, you know where 70% of the people live so we are going to soon start a rural journalism course from our uh, riva campus riva is i mean riva is the university and riva is a you know a district in madhya pradesh so uh, riva campus so i mean the whole idea is that you know uh, we need to focus on those specialized domains also and i hope uh, dr sapna uh, we all remember that how you know i gave a big push to language journalism during my tenure at so we had started at that time uh, marathi journalism from amravati campus in maharashtra malayalam journalism from kerala campus urdu journalism from delhi campus now please remember that today more and more readers viewers they are all shifting to and listeners are shifting to language media indian languages are thriving in the media so more and more media outlets are opening in the local languages so if we are going to prepare so it is important that we prepare groom students in language language skill is going to be a very important part you know language skill so i think that media education one of the complaints that i often get when we go for placements when we talk to industry experts they say that no no whether it is any institution you know uh they all say one thing that the language skills of the students are at the lowest today because they have been maybe influenced by that you know english or you call it you know the uh, twitter twitterati i don't know whatever you call it but the fact is that the, the 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 standard of language has come down like anything so we need to focus and that's what there is a lot of focus in this nep on uh, you know uh, on mother tongue and other uh, language skills also uh, it has emphasized on languages so can we ensure that the language skills of the media student because it is his lang his or her language skills that is going to score over their rivals when it comes to jobs placements promotions that's important something that i need to last uh, uh, points is that uh, because there is again paucity of time so i i just wanted to say that you know i think this is a great opportunity for us uh, this national education policy this is the time when we need to now ug programs now becoming pg programs i mean uh, four year programs will ensure that we are able to bring in that specialization we are able to you know actually allow students because a lot of students after uh, you know uh, even you know after one year or two year they all they exit because their first option is jobs today this allows lateral entry and somebody can exit with a certificate after one year a diploma after two years a degree after 
three years and an honors after four years. So this would enable that students can come back and because of the academic credit bank, which is transferable today, if a boy from Bhopal who has done his two years in Bhopal can shift to Bangalore and he has got a job in Bangalore and he can continue with his education at Reva University or Mysuru University with the, his credits in place and he needs to only do his degree and his honors from there. He need not go through again the two two years program. So I think that this facilitates and this is a facility and it, internationally the four year program is recognized. In fact, people always had problems with it, particularly students looking at international uh, studies. So uh, friends, I mean, this is a subject with on which we can talk and talk, but I'm sure that I will also be able to receive a lot of inputs from all of you, uh, very eminent uh, panelists who have joined this. And thank you, uh, Dr. Sapna and uh, Riva University for inviting me to address this, uh, uh, you know, uh, webinar. I think that it's very good idea um, proposed by Professor Kumaravel that we, uh, you know, bring out some document from this, which can be, uh, you know, which can serve as a, a, a paper for all of us, uh, you know, policy paper for all the media institutions. That will be a great idea. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, Thank you, sir, for setting the strong stage and a strong basement from where the other panelists will also try to build on that. As yes, we know that uh, the uh, media education, especially is on the crossroads, there are a lot of things when you spoke about about standardization, there is no proper standardization or there is no proper control for the media education has been one of the very forte which we need to look into because many of them, as you told, there is been a control when it comes to bar council and all but when it comes to media education we are lacking that is yes, there has to be a kind of standardization and you also told about the strong theoretical foundation which is being given and the new courses like uh, visual effect there are many universities which are still stuck in the old age kind of a curriculum where we still speak of agricultural communication yes it's needed but not to such an extent so because we have to look into the positive side and we also see we also need to check with the kind of technological That's development true. which is happening in in the world of uh, media. So new uh, the courses like visual communication, gaming, comics, robotics are the, uh, there are a lot of takers. The only thing is we are not providing them the proper courses. Absolutely. And you told that, yes, uh, we need to develop a strong uh, vernacular or the language uh, education, media education also, which can also help the students to become much more multitasker. So we'll and, take up some questions and as and when the panelists. Sapna, Sapna, Thank you, sir. Sapna, Dr. Sapna, we are celebrating 100 years of media, media education this year, education. and this is the right time to yeah. reflect, introspect and move ahead. Yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I call upon, so hopefully you'll be, Bill will be with us so that we can take the questions at the end of the discussion, sir. Thanks a lot for such uh, uh, wonderful thoughts of yours. Uh, now we have our second panelist. Uh, <clears throat> A second panelist will be Professor Poonananda sir, professor from Kuwempu University in Shumoga. A brief uh, intro about uh, Professor Poonananda sir has been an alumni of the University of Mysore, our department. Sir at presently has uh, is with uh, the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication as a professor at Kuwempu University, Shumoga, with a spanning of 34 years of experience. Professor Poonananda has got a specialization in communication theory, development communication, environmental communication and film studies. He has also been a visiting fellow to Walda University College, Norway in the year 2001. Sir has also been a Fulbright fellow in the year 1997-98 where he visited Syracuse University in New York uh, in USA. Till date he has got around 110 uh, presentations, paper presentation, research paper presentation at various conferences and seminars. Sir has been visiting and also has been presenting a lot of international uh, papers and international uh, conferences such as in Washington, Norway, Canada, Spain, Istanbul, as well as Germany, because these kind of international exposure will make the education, especially the media education, much more stronger. So Sir has completed around four research projects and also has published 53 papers and has a book to his credit also. Apart from that, he has also had a lot of uh, administrative experiences. Today here he is with us to speak on the research opportunities in media education. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, uh, Sapna, uh, Professor Kumarwe, uh, Professor K.G. Suresh, uh, 
Dr. Sapna Nayak, uh, Professor Nandini, and other co-panelists. And uh, you know, I am uh, going to uh, speak uh, on. Uh, uh, please don't put it up now. Uh, I don't need this uh, slide now. Uh, hello. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. I'll take it. Uh, okay. Um, you know, um, I'll be, uh, you know, talking about the most uh, unglamorous part of media education, that is media research. Uh, you know, the world of media has seen unprecedented change and expansion in the last uh, three decades. Technological changes and economic uh, integration of the world have uh, made this uh, possible. And the number of people using media has grown uh, exponentially. The size and diversity have both uh, gone up. And any sector that grows at this rate throws up uh, many challenges and also opportunities. And in terms of what can be explored or what can be uh, you know, studied, there are unlimited uh, opportunities. In fact, uh, there are a lot of areas, subjects, and issues that are yet to be understood and uh, explained fully. So there is a great diversity of uh, topics when we look at journalism research. However, in terms of resources, infrastructure, and institutional support, there is a lot we desire. Uh, you know, Dennis Maxwell, you know, most of us have uh, uh, you know, grown up studying uh, his books on communication theory. Uh, Dennis Mack will say there is lack of coherence in what is meant by media and communication studies. Uh, he says, uh, he is actually saying it in comparison with uh, disciplines like social sciences, humanities, and uh, natural uh, sciences. And he feels uh, the inadequacy of media studies as a discipline. Uh, and he says uh, this has actually uh, resulted in lack of a theory. So, uh, if there is inadequacy, uh, uh, you know, uh, of our media studies as a discipline, there is naturally lack of uh, a focus on uh, on theory. And in relation to that, I want to bring in uh, uh, an article that was written by Craig M. Trombo some uh, uh, years ago. He went through eight important or eight leading articles, uh, sorry, uh, journals on uh, mass communication and journalism, including uh, communication monographs, communication research, critical studies in mass communication, human communication research, general of broadcasting and electronic media, general communication, general of mass communication, uh, journalism and mass communication quarterly, and quarterly journal of speech. He went through all these, uh, you know, um, journals, and he found that 57% of the studies were uh, quantitative and 41% were qualitative, and only 2% of the studies were a combination of, uh, of both. And triangulation as methodological approach was rarely used. But then the focus, my focus is not that. Of course, there were these kinds of studies. But one interesting that uh, one interesting thing that he talks about uh, uh, is is that as many as 58% of the studies were a theoretical. That means they lack theoretical framework. So there has been a sharp increase uh, in empirical studies focusing on digital and uh, global change in journalism and communication. Many of these studies are interesting and relevant, but uh, they fall out of theorizing the meanings and consequences of the changes. This is what. Uh, you know, Dennis Maxwell was trying to uh, show, and that's what Trumbo is trying to show us. There's a great scope for theoretical studies. Another problem Dennis Maxwell identifies is uh, uh, too much attention being given to technology and media effects. Uh, he thinks that disproportionate attention has been paid to technological innovation with very little interpretation. The question here is, uh, you know, about the extent to which we can use our research abilities to explore problems and uh, explore problems in social and cultural context. And to what extent we can use uh, the technology. Technology is not uh, everything because uh, 
uh, Matt will repeatedly talks about uh, how we are over focusing on uh, on technology. In fact, the trade today in several parts of the world, especially United States and uh, uh, Europe, is specialization subject wise, not on the basis of technology. It's not that you specialize in radio, you specialize in multimedia, you specialize in you know. Uh, mobile journalism or something like this, but the focus should be decided on, on subjects because subject-wise research or subject-wise specialization will actually help research grow in the field of journalism and mass communication. And media institutions and journalism as a profession and uh, as a practice, you know, it is evolving, uh, sorry, evolving. And conventional media institutions are facing the challenge from digital platforms and fragmented uh, audiences so whose attention and interest no longer converge around the traditional tenets of news uh, making. And with most uh, conventional media moving to digital platforms, leading to media convergence, the conventional methods with which we were doing research has to change. As a result, significant amount of academic publications have focused on this kind of change alone. But these studies are more descriptive than critical. In fact, changes in media landscapes associated with globalization and digitization demand new conceptual frameworks. They also demand a reflexive understanding of what is prevalent in professions, in, in professional practice, media industries, and journalistic cultures. Media scholarship must constantly reflect upon the question uh, and, and question dominant assumptions about what constitutes knowledge and contribution to, to understanding media, journalism, and, and society. There is a need to understand how media institutions have changed uh, in global and digital times. There is also a need to examine the theories and concepts that should be advanced uh, to analyze these changes. We have to transcend conventional geographical and sociocultural settings to broad base our uh, inquiry. You know, are there gaps between theories and practices across media platforms? Are conceptual frameworks in communication and media studies in consonance with the research taking place in the uh, area of social sciences? You know, these are important questions. We need to examine the relevance of theories, models, and concepts that explain how journalism and communication work across contexts and across cultures. Now, inter interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary approach or approaches are helpful in systematically building the innovative, theoretical, and conceptual perspective. There is a need to understand both the challenges and the prospects that journalism and mass communication face in the new media landscape. The strengths and weaknesses of established theoretical frameworks need to be tested and, and explained. Of course, there are some limitations associated with research in uh, communication and, and uh, media uh, studies. Uh, there is, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, research is not a, not a serious business in several institutions. It lacks a scientific rigor. There has been lackadaisical attitude towards research. You know, research is not taken seriously, and there is general lack of resources for research in communication and media studies. Of course, there are scholarships, JRF, uh, you know, uh, the ICSS is funding, so several institutions are funding. But you, as compared to other, um, you know, disciplines, um, <clears throat> you know, there aren't, there aren't many, uh, you know, funding uh, sources for uh, research in journalism and mass communication. Of course, there are bureaucratic barriers. Uh, that means the lack of autonomy to the teacher to do uh, research. And uh, there is a problem, especially for uh, those who do content analysis and uh, those who analyze documents, reports, and all that. Archival uh, material is hard to find. For those who want to do uh, content analysis of newspapers, those who want to do content analysis of television and radio, there isn't systematic data available. And media institutions do not cooperate. Suppose I want to find out, you know, you know, how many employees are there in a particular media institution from which of the social categories and what salaries uh, do they draw and uh, 
uh, what are these hierarchical levels uh, uh, you know uh, do do they uh, sit in so these kinds of data are simply not available you know some of my phd students have found it very hard to get any information from newspapers we don't have data as to how many people are employed in a big media uh, organization so these are issues and of course you have lack of access to information and the database you know we may have right to information act and all that but sharing information is also part of our culture suppose somebody comes and ask me in my own department how many students how many phd students have done research on a particular topic in the last 10 15 years i would not have data with me so this is the kind of um, you know the the the, the way uh, with which institutions function so this has to change and many of the institutions are not research friendly at all and if you go to newspapers for example whether it's a newspaper or television station you don't have uh, you know archival material you, you don't get newspapers newspaper issues from 1980 to uh, 2000 if you want to do some kind of kind of research and newspapers do charge heavily for one uh, issue of a newspaper they might charge around 500 to 600 newspapers just to see so it's very very expensive so uh, you know research scholars have had lot of tough time especially those who have been doing content analysis so let us see if the national education policy can address some of these issues some of the problems that we uh, that we have of course i will not uh, talk about uh, basics of uh, general, uh, you know uh, new education policy but i will refer to some of the things that talk about higher higher education Uh, one of the key elements of the national education policy 2020 is the focus on multidisciplinary approach to higher education media research from the beginning as all of you know has been multidisciplinary most of the big names in communication research came from different disciplines whether it's paul lazar's file carl holland you know marshall mcluhan uh, elizabeth noel newman and uh, you know the the frankfurt school uh, scholars like for kaimar adorno marcus uh then you know stuart hall you know and then philosophers like habermas and the you know other scholars like kipendroff raymond williams all these people have contributed so much to research they came from diverse diverse fields in this context i feel what the nep is proposing national education policy proposing is very very significant multidisciplinary approach to higher education is largely going to benefit uh a multi disciplinary subject like journalism and mass communication in fact by its very nature communication studies is multi disciplinary and uh, the national education policy also talks about uh multi disciplinary research and research funding um so if the policy is implemented in the right spirit it's going to give a big boost to research in communication and media Um, uh, media studies in fact national education uh, policy talks against fragmentation uh, in fact the policy aims to end the fragmentation of higher education by transforming higher education uh, higher education institutions into large multi multidisciplinary universities and and uh, colleges so the new education policy proposes to develop active research communities across disciplines so this is going to benefit you know communication researchers and it also talks about uh, resource efficiency but uh, you know that is uh, you know uh, not the focus uh, of this presentation uh, here so lot of uh, um in focus is there on uh, you know multidisciplinary approach to research in fact this is not uh, something new espal committee uh, report has said the same in fact the kotari commission too has stressed on the autonomy and the national knowledge commission has also emphasized the uh, uh, autonomy so it all depends on what kind of autonomy will ultimately come to the uh, you know uh, universities and all of these uh, reports including knowledge uh, commission report they have all in you know, a spoken against setting up of mono discipline universities if you are talking about multi discipline discipline university you you can't go on setting up of single subject universities you look at what has happened 
in university system today the, there are agriculture universities now there is agriculture university there is horticulture university there is animal sciences university we have music university performing arts panchayat raj university then there are language universities in in uh, you know in canada in malayalam so you know, some of them do not even have a single faculty even after decades of uh, you know uh, existence so i think the national education policy has you know very very <clears throat> significantly talked about the need for multidisciplinary uh, research of course uh, the the uh, document the, the policy also talks about uh, three categories of uh, higher education institutions uh, research intensive universities teaching uh, you know in and autonomous degree granting uh, colleges the research universities will largely focus on research the you know teaching universities uh, will largely focus on teaching but they will also do uh, uh, research of course this is something that is yet to be uh, fully understood how this classification of universities is uh, going to work i i do not know now and what kind of autonomy they will enjoy i'm not sure but uh, if the true autonomy is given if what is said in the policy document is implemented is is going to provoke lot of uh, you know opportunities for journalism and mass communication research because journalism and mass communication research is something that's connected to other social sciences connected to natural sciences connected to environmental sciences so many so many other disciplines and interestingly national education policy talks about uh, national research foundation uh you know if you have uh, closely watched the uh, um you know honorable minister uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh honorable finance minister's uh, budget presentation uh, some months uh, uh, ago uh, nirmala sitaraman uh, has actually said that um, you know rupees 50000 crores uh, you know would be allocated for setting up of national research foundation now we have lot of funding institutions like ugc like icssr like barc like department of science and technology so many funding funding organizations are there so this is going to be a kind of umbrella funding organization uh, <clears throat> so there will be one single uh, you know big uh, funding organization which is going to fund research so all of us you know can actually apply uh, for uh, research grants and this uh, you know in the national research foundation is uh, set up is going to be set up with the purpose of funding peer reviewed research that is important and the proposal is that 0.1% of the gdp would be spent on research and uh, innovation in the in the country and uh, towards the above the, the policy document uh, says there must be a comprehensive approach to transforming the quality and quality quality and quantity of research in india and this includes definitely shifts to a move uh, to, to be a more play and discovery based style of learning with a key emphasis on the scientific method and critical thinking what we must notice is that the policy document is talking about introducing scientific thinking and critical think are promoting scientific thinking and critical thinking at full level itself so that it benefits uh, uh, you know research at the university uh, university level but in comparison to other uh, um, you know uh, countries we are lagging behind in terms of the amount of money that we spend on uh, research and innovation for example each year spends 4.3% of its gdp on research and innovation south korea spends 4.2% of its gdp usa spends 2.8% of its gdp china spends 2.1% of its gdp and india right now is is spending only 0.69% of its gdp on research and uh, uh, innovation it was 0.84 in 2008 So it came down to 0.69 in uh, 2018, and these are the figures which are available in the uh, national education policy. Uh, and uh, to be specific, if you go to section 17.3, you will find these uh, these figures. 
So it is proposed to raise this percentage to at least 2%. But the experts uh, in, in the industry uh, and, 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 and the leaders in the industry are saying that it uh, must go up to at least 2%. Uh, it's also important to raise the allocation of education from 4.6% to, uh, uh, you know, 6% of the, of, the, of the GDP. Of course, there are countries where uh, more than 12% of the GDP is spent on, uh, on, uh, on education. I hope we will reach this 6.6% uh, 6 uh, 6 mark in the near, uh, uh, near future. Now, I want to draw your attention to one article you know that uh, you know martin demeter wrote uh, two years ago in journalism and mass communication quarterly as all of you know journalism and mass communication quarterly is a very important uh, research journal so this article uh, you know analyzed 79 web of science index journals between 1975 and uh, 2017 you know, the title of this article is the winner, the winner takes all international inequality in communication and media studies uh, today. And one of the main challenges the publishers and, edit and editors of journals have is getting their journals indexed in high quality international databases such as Web of Sciences or Scopus. The articles published in these journals are highly visible and highly cited. Authors from all around the world would like to publish their articles in the leading articles from developed countries because the journals published from developed countries have very high visibility. There are journals from the developing countries that do not have visibility. So again, there are very few authors who publish uh, in the leading periodicals or those who publish regularly in leading periodicals. As I told you, this was a study which involved 79 leading, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, index uh, journals. So even if the authors from developing countries succeed in publishing their work in leading journals, they are less cited than their developed country colleagues. The only chance uh, for a developed country author to become internationally recognized is to emigrate, uh, to, to to emigrate or to cooperate with developed. Uh, country authors. So, in terms of publishers, uh, it was found that all the uh, you know, social science uh, citation index journals in the communication and media studies are in the hands of publishers from the global north. Half of the periodicals are published in the United States. You know, half of the uh, periodicals are published in United States alone. I request Manjunath to put up that slide. If you can see this, uh, uh, you know, uh, table. See, this is not what exactly the uh, table is in the journalism and mass communication quarterly. I have taken whatever is essential from that uh, um, magazine. Uh, sorry, for, for that particular article. So what I have, what I have, uh, you know, put on this screen is something that I have uh, made up. Of course, the data is from uh, this particular uh, article. So 90% of the reading journals are from English speaking countries. So a total of 6% of uh, the indexed uh, uh, you know, periodicals in communication media so are from the Netherlands, 3% from Germany, and 1% from, from Spanish uh, uh, contribution. So the study also found a significant correlation between per capita GDP and the publication output. So if the uh, you know, per capita GDP is very high. The publication output in the particular country is also very high. And then this is common to, uh, you know, research articles in social sciences and also in natural sciences. This is not something which is peculiar to uh, communication and media studies. But this particular paper looks at only 79 uh, uh, you know, publications which are indexed. This is something that you know takes us close to the dependency theory. You know, dependency theory talks about center and the periphery. So, as a developing country, we are at the periphery. There are some nations which are at the center. So, there is an equal uh, relationship between uh, the global north and the global uh, global south. 
So if you look at this particular uh, table, you will notice that in India, uh, uh, the percentage is uh, uh, just below 1%. The United States, 69% of the authors who publish in these journals are from United States alone. You can see the massive difference that exists between United States and other countries. England is next, but it is 5%. That was between 2012 and uh, sorry, 1975 and 2012. Uh, the, uh, the column on the right side talks about uh, the publication from uh, it actually 2013, not 1913, 2013 to 2017, which is uh, <clears throat> you know, just um, four uh, uh, years. So uh, what you notice is that uh, United States dominates when it comes to communication and media uh, studies uh, research. Of course, there are other countries. Uh, China has a 2%, but uh, if you look at what has done in the recent years, the Chinese share has uh, uh, gone up. It has moved from eighth position in uh, 2012 to, uh, in fact, fifth position in, 2000, in 2017. So, uh, this this table is helpful to us to understand where India stands. Of course, the number of publishers, number of authors who publish remains the same, 28 and 28. But 28 articles have appeared in just a few years in the last, uh, you know, seven. Oh, sorry, five, uh, five years. So this is something which is important to us to see how this is uh, you know, going to change in the coming years. Why I put this up is that we, we lack, we lack behind research compared to the other countries. And then we must play hard uh, to, to catch, if not catch up with the other countries, but to make much more contribution. The conceptual and theoretical work in communication media studies has been Western centric, and uh, some uh, perspectives that have come from the global north have become universal and they have dominated communication media studies for decades. And there is vast scope to challenge the theoretical perspective of the global north and to move towards constructing ideas and knowledge, uh, and ideas and knowledge based on our own social, economic, political, and cultural context. So we need resources infrastructure and institutional support system to make use of the opportunities that lie ahead. I hope the National Education Policy 2020 will make it uh, possible and that it will take into consideration the huge gap that exists between uh, India and the developed countries in terms of research output in the area of mass communication and, and journalism. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I have taken more time. Thank you, Purnananda, sir. That was very extensive. Uh, but anyways, it was very interesting because as you told us, it's still been considered as the unglamorized uh, part of the media education. Still, we see that many of the people doesn't feel like doing research, even if the research are being done, it's not on a very innovative ideas and we are still sticking on to the old kind of things. And your talk was uh, more on how the new topics has to be explored and how we have been lagging behind as compared to other countries. And also your point uh, regarding this National Research Foundation, which has been earmarked as the funding uh, as, as the funding has to be increased during this NEP. Let's hope that this will become a, a reality so that many more number of research work can be undertaken also. And you also stressed more on uh, the multidisciplinary research which we are lacking and maybe in the future, in the days to come, we need to do that. And lack of support, uh, institutional support, or maybe it can be an individual uh, people or individual faculty who wants to take up the research. It's also there. It's not only about the individual lacking, but at the same time, the lack of funding agencies and maybe the institutional support also has to be seen uh, in a different perspective so that the research in the future and with the NEP coming in, so things looks much more brighter and the kind of statistics what you gave where we are still on the bottom of the table which needs to be improvised as a, our competitor like China has been moving up to the ladder. 
So hopefully uh, your talk has given us a lot of idea because we are still young uh, researchers. We are looking for all these things. And when you said there is 58% of the untheoretical work or research work is been happening in the uh, in the subject. It's a really a matter of concern for people like us that is yes, we have to look into the brighter side and hopefully in the future things will follow up. Thanks a lot, sir, for uh, in, uh, giving us more insight on the research which we are still lacking. Now I call upon uh, our third speaker, uh, Professor uh, Seema Sangra, who is a program leader, Media Studies Department, Amit University, Dubai. She will be speaking on comparative analysis of media education in India and Western country. Uh, just to brief you about uh, Professor Seema's uh, bio, uh, as I told, she is a program leader, Media Studies Department, Amit University, Dubai, UAE. And her forte is media content creation and packaging. She did started her career with the mainstream media, where she has uh, worked with advertising industry, television, radio, and print also. But later on, moved on towards development communication, where she has seen and where she her career journey has taken from Coke to communities. And she has also been working with uh, companies like Nestle, it's Maggie to uh, MDG, that is the Millennium uh, Goals. Her passionate about understanding new media's impact on society and equally anxious about environmental sustainable issues. And that's the reason why she has conceptualized uh, and created the Echo Journal. And as I told, she is uh, she has got an undying car for stories and art of storytelling. And she's been a regular writer also. Presently, she's based in Dubai. I welcome uh, Professor Seema Sangra to uh, present your thoughts on the topic comparative analysis of media education in India and Western countries. And your time limit is just 10 minutes. Thank you. You're mute. Mute. You're on mute. Uh, I think this is some other issue beyond technical issue, but anyways. Um, I uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much for inviting me to such an important discussion. It was absolute, absolute uh, delight uh, to listen to uh, Professor uh, Suresh. Uh, he uh, I feel my presentation is over. He covered almost everything that's important to move forward. And uh, I'm I'm so happy uh, that he mentioned most important factor uh, which we must uh, pay attention to. Uh, to, uh, is that the mushrooming of media colleges in India. Uh, you, you know, uh, it is so important that there is some kind of regulation because uh, when the journalists are trained in these institutions, uh, they create the media industry that we complain about later. And you don't send your farmers uh, to soldiers to get training and vice versa. So if you want uh, a healthy media industry, you need healthy media studies uh, institutions which are well regulated. And I'm sure the stakeholders are paying attention towards this very, very important uh, issue. Now uh, I will uh, I will share my presentation. I am told to speak on media education in India and make a comparative analysis uh, with the, the Western universities. So let me share my presentation with you. Uh, give me a minute, please. OK, so. Uh, why? Well, uh, if you look at uh, media education in India, it is uh, still. Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK, so if you look at the media institution, media education in India, it is still at its infancy. You know, if you look at media education's growth in India, it happened after first Gulf War in 1991, and uh, it also subsides with the uh, government's economic policy of liberalization during that time. And uh, that also uh, created media's growth, vertical and horizontal growth, and also, uh, you know, created scope for media education education and we started paying attention towards uh, media education. So if you um, uh, uh, Professor Suresh mentioned that we are celebrating uh, 100 years of media education, but I would say that the, uh, if you look at the pre-independence and post-independence, uh, then uh, the first pre-independence, the first media, uh, journalism course was introduced in National University in Madras in 1920 and in 1938 Aligarh Muslim University offered a certificate course in journalism. But if you look at the post independence, uh, I would like to mention these three institutions started by the uh, uh, Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. So in 1900, 
160 FTI was studied, but I wouldn't call it uh, just media studies institution. It was film institution, which is just one component of uh, media studies. And uh, in uh, 1965, Indian Institution of uh, Mass Communication was started, and I'm a proud alumni of the institution. Um, and this was the first comprehensive, for comprehensive media institution where different media platforms during that time were well covered and students were trained to uh, for the they were trained for the industry keeping the industry requirements in mind uh, later on in 1982 jamia milia islamia uh, was started and these are the three institutions uh, which uh, were started post independence and if we consider this time it's uh, like uh, half a century uh, of uh, media education. Uh, if you look at, if you compare it, because I'm I'm told to com make a comparative analysis. Uh, if you look at the uh, how media studies started in the Western countries, uh, media education started in 1920s in France, like proper structured media ed education. Uh, so if we, we look at the time gap, it's half a century's gap in a structured form of media education. So I do not know that uh, uh, if, uh, you know, um, uh, creating if, uh, uh, you know, ki any kind of uh, media anal the analysis can be done. Uh, but what we can do is that we can look at uh, the uh, kind of we can look at the following things which we can be considered as uh, the comparison. So I'll focus on the designing of the course. If you look at the designing of the course uh, in the Western universities, you will find that they are very uh, based on very, very contemporary industry needs and they are very much futuristic in their approach. Uh, the curricular design and the review committee in these universities and institutions uh, consists of industry professionals. For example, uh, Association of Journalism Education regulates upgradation of media education in UK and uh, in other Western universities also you will find the, uh, that there are, uh, you know, practitioners who are involved in designing the course as well as reviewing the course. Uh, the, the focus of the syllabus, I'm going to share it later. If you look at the kind of syllabus these universities offer are very, very contemporary and futuristic in nature. Uh, the syllabus is uh, created to cater to the industry requirements and the curriculum design and curriculum review is done on periodically with the people who are going to hire your students later on. So they know what is required, what kind of workforce is required. Uh, here, by no means, I'm saying that there shouldn't be a focus on theory or there shouldn't be, a, you know, it should be all hands on. That's not the intention at all. If you look at the syllabus, the kind of curriculum they have, you will realize uh, that. I'm going to share this curriculum with you. I'm trying to be as fast as possible, Dr. <laughs> uh, so I've taken this uh, first semester curriculum from Swinburne University in Australia. And if you look at the kind of courses they are offering uh, in the first semester, and they have media industries, media ecologies, engaging audiences, digital cultures, aesthetics, markets, industries. Then they here I want you to pay focus on they have social media analytics and data research and visual, visualization. Now show me one curriculum in Indian um, uh, uh, media studies courses where you have these kind of subjects uh, in the very first semester. Uh, maybe there are you maybe there are few universities that are offering it, but they are exceptions and norm and we are talking about norm here and uh, they you also have media industry experience uh, thankfully uh, and i'm proud to say that way back um, in Indian Institution of Mass Communication, this was well focused upon. We were trained, we were given, it, there was, it was mandatory for us to go for uh, in that, uh, industry internship uh, where we learned basics of how uh, people work in the, any uh, media pl uh, platform. So uh, these are the things, uh, now some private universities are working towards it and it's very much part of their curriculum to send students for media industry experience, which is a very welcome thing to do. But we look at the federal universities somewhere. This is lagging. We, we don't have this kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, 
this kind of facility or this kind of effort where the students are sent to the media industry to work and realize for themselves that what what is required from them. Now, um, uh, if you look at uh, the, the the flexibility in the syllabus, there is far more flexibility in the uh, syllabuses. If you look at different course curriculum of Western universities, there there is a lot of flexibility. Uh, they, they focus on what students want to learn or what they should learn. Now again, uh, uh, the theory part is extremely important and uh, hands on, though there is emphasis on hands on training, but uh, there is a flexibility they, they incorporate and it is all the more required now because I tell my students that, you know, when I started uh, teaching semester one, there was we were like in uh, in 2016, uh, 2018, there was no TikTok. And by the time they were graduating, TikTok became such an important platform. So this kind of flexibility where you can introduce new platforms because never ever in the history of uh, media industry and media education things have changed with such fast pace and syllabuses are not made every six months you know so there has to be a provision of flexibility where the media educator should or can introduce uh, these uh, new components, uh, uh, the emerging trends and um, new media technologies. So there has to be a scope of uh, these kind of things where uh, you can uh, be in line with the media require the industry requirement. Now, if you look at Indian approach, and this is my personal view, uh, I'm sure there are many who may disagree with me, but uh, there is some kind of rigidity in that. Uh, and I'm very hopeful that with the new education policy, it's going to change a lot. And when I when I say rigidity, I want to give you one example. You know, there is a lot of focus on the history. Uh, you know, history of different media platforms. Uh, history is uh, very important to to build our understanding, to learn few things and move forward. But history is not the place where we need to live in. So when it comes to media uh, studies, media uh, studies related subjects, it's very important that there is less there. Ha history has to be there, but there is less focus on uh, history of different media platforms, which I find uh, we can do without uh, in the, the, the especially the percentage. Sometimes half of the syllabus is about the history of different media platforms. So that is important. And as uh, Professor Suresh mentioned that multiple options uh, have to be there. You know, uh, if I had my way, I would make uh, uh, psychology and uh, sociology prerequisite for media students. And even if that's not possible, there has to be a uh, there has to be a provision where they are introduced to these two streams also. And interdisciplinary is very, very important. Uh, talking about futuristic approach, as I was mentioning that uh, media technologies are changing. No one is talking about virtual journalism. As he mentioned, we need to have these courses on different animation courses, gaming courses. Uh, you tell me one industry where uh, the VR, I was talking to someone and I mentioned uh, that nowadays media students need not go for media organizations to work for. They can work in any any organization because all these other industries have their social media pages. They have their portals. They need writers. They need graphic designers. They need uh, people who can create content and so much so like here in Dubai because it's there's a lot of uh, uh, real estate uh, uh, business here. Uh, if you go earlier, they would uh, display uh, a mini model of any uh, project. So people would go and they will look at that model and there used to be uh, these um, model houses, model apartments where people would go and look at it and say, OK, I want to purchase it or not. But now we have reached a point and this pandemic has added to that uh, where, uh, you know, the virtual uh, virtual projects are created. The VR technology is giving experience where a buyer can experience that, how it's going to be live, uh, you know, in that kind of apartment. So who's creating that content? They need people to create that kind of content. And when we say there are no jobs in media, we are just looking at journalism jobs. And even in journalism, you have to train, you have to make your journalists uh, capable of handling 
handling the present day requirements, which is more uh, towards online portals and the kind of uh, industry we have at uh, uh, right now. Uh, so that's extremely important that we uh, prepare our students for the uh, for the industry. They have to be industry ready. They have to be given experience where they can uh, go and uh, start working. Also, uh, when I was when I uh, passed out from the this media Indian Institute of uh, Mass Communication, my first job was with the multinational advertising agency. But I, I was lucky enough that that was the time when we had to watch our seniors to work for six months and then take up the assignments. But today, the day you join, you are expected to deliver. So who, how are we to are our students uh, ready to deliver from the very first day? of their work. Also, um, SGPA, CGPA, percentage grades are very, very important. But if a student, if a person, I uh, because I was I've worked, I have industry experience and I have hired many people, uh, I uh, I won't look at uh, the percentage of grades. I will look at whether the person can deliver or not. What is the attitude of the person? Uh, that, Lines are very, very important. So are we training our students? Are we giving the assignments which prepare them to write a story in half an hour's time? Uh, are we, uh, have we changed the way we evaluate their work? What are the kind of uh, home assignments we are giving? What are the kind of class exercises we are doing? That's extremely important. Uh, then other than that, uh, if you look at the teaching methodology, um, I mentioned that the kind of uh, subjects which are being offered in the first semester in some of the Western universities. Now today, if I feel that, OK, let me introduce those subjects in my curriculum. Do I have uh, access to faculty who can teach it? Are, uh, are we training? Are we upgrading our uh, uh, faculty skills? Because to teach new media technologies, are they exposed to that me new media technology? Because we we have, uh, and I would like to recommend here, because I'm sure the, the, the points are being taken here, uh, that, you know, we, in, uh, we feel very good about sending our students for the internship to the media industry to know uh, that what kind of work is expected from there or how they operate. I think it's, it should be made mandatory for even the media faculty to have one kind one month or one week or two weeks of training session in media organization. Let them go and see how they work, how the stories are filed, how what kind of deadlines are uh, is given to the uh, to the workers. So until or unless they are exposed to that kind of work environment, sending students for internship is not going to help much, uh, and uh, especially when they are not trained. Uh, then adaptation and dissemination of knowledge using latest technology and software. Uh, when we compare, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the media courses in India and media courses in Western universities, we must understand that um, you know, um, we have some inherent uh, limitations. Uh, we have uh, we have certain uh, stumbling blocks. We have internet. Uh, internet is not available for everybody. Softwares are uh, are not available for everyone. We uh, do understand that, but it is important that we find a way out where all these things are accessible. What kind of media method, teaching methodology are we using? Are we sticking to the conventional mode of uh, imparting education, or are we introducing non-traditional methods of, uh, you know, uh, imparting education? Here at MIT Dubai, especially in our department, we pay a lot of focus on tangible outcome of the uh, course. Like uh, when a student joins here, we make sure that by the end of the, by the time the student graduates from the institution, along with the the grades which no one is going to look at they are they must have something to show to the employer potential employer that this is what i'm capable of so they be fixed in the beginning each and every um, assignment is linked with tangible out, uh, output whereby uh, if you have to file a story that story should be worth showing it to your potential employer and not to just get grades. So adaptation and dissemination of knowledge using latest technology and software is important and emphasis on media production by students, which is which can be uh, tangible output of what they have learned and how they are moving forward. What what how uh, my one line brief to students is that your product should be ready to uh, telecast or ready to broadcast of that standard. Nothing less than that. 
And uh, if you look at the uh, focus of technology literacy, uh, how literate we are technology wise, are we uh, uh, even aware of the latest technology? Are teachers aware of the latest technology? That's important. Digital literacy and media literacy is part of our curriculum. So but that really needs to be emphasized more uh, then again evaluation how we evaluate our students what are the rubrics uh, do they know that what kind of uh, rubrics we have fixed for the their evaluation and as i mentioned earlier that it has to be linked with uh, yeah, their their work has to be linked with the tangible product when it comes to media production uh, course now uh, one thing I would like to emphasize here again is that media education, if you look at the Western universities, is rooted in global worldview and global value. So students who who study there have an overall worldview. They know what is happening in in other parts of the world, and we live in a global village. We cannot have two centric, two India centric courses. And uh, I I am a huge uh, fan of. Uh, our national broadcaster. Uh, it's the world's largest network. Uh, it's uh, the, the kind of programming they have done. It's it, it fulfills the role of media, you know, the, the social responsibility of media. But at the same time, you can't be teaching your students. Half the course can't be on Doordarshan and All India Radio. You know, it is very, very important that they they know about it because we get our roots from there. We must be proud that the journey we have made in from 1959 to till 2021, the media we see is output of what we created just 12 years of independence. So we should be very, very proud of it. But at the same time, you cannot be focused towards just Udarshan and All India Radio. Your students must know what's happening in the other part of the world, how journalism is being covered, what kind of stories they are doing. So that that's important and uh, infrastructure differences. Uh, I will not dwell much on it because we have less time here. Uh, labs, what kind of labs we have, what kind of resources we have and quality education cannot be completed with quality uh, uh, well experienced staff here again one point is that you know the industry professionals most of the time they don't have phds and uh, the uh, phds do not have uh, and this is not a journal statement it's like most of the time so uh, if you want to bring in these professionals inside their wealth of knowledge there has to be a provision uh, in the system where the, they can come and uh, impart their uh, knowledge and experience with the media students. And as I mentioned, industry experience should not be only for the uh, students, but also for the uh, for the teachers. And uh, I'll conclude by uh, a few suggestions and I, I look forward to uh, actually convert this into a research paper later, which can be linked with the policy making, etc. And I will be in touch with your uh, university in case anyone is interested. Um, so to improve media education, in India focus should be on curriculum design, interdisciplinary and much uh, disciplinary approach, which Professor Suresh mentioned, uh, uh, role of academic bodies, who all are there in the academic bodies, if, whether the practitioners are there or not, infrastructure, facilities, faculty development, research, which uh, the speaker before me mentioned a lot about it, and it's very, very important. Um, industry interface collaborations and partnerships with other stakeholders because see as he mentioned that you know there's dearth of people uh, for the uh, for the jobs which are there in the market so we really need to involve uh, these stakeholders who can tell us that what is their requirement and how we can improve our curriculum how we can train our students so that's extremely important and uh, i will I, I hope i was uh, i i finished within 15 minutes Yes, but uh, I'll conclude with this uh, uh, quote from Upanishads where they say that where there is a joy, there is a creation and where there is no joy, there is no creation. So uh, if we want creative people, if we want creative industry professionals, if we want creative media professionals uh, with media ethics in place, with journalistic practices in place, where uh, other new media practices in place, I think we really need to relook at the curriculum we are offering, the syllabus we are offering, because uh, what we are going to invest, we are going to get later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Seema, for an extensive uh, uh, insight into how compare when you compare the, the kind of uh, teaching, especially the media education in Western countries as well as in India. As as you rightly pointed out, certain issues can be related to the kind of 
syllabi what we have because when you spoke about the very first semester in an Australian university which has got research, which has got data analytics, which has got social media analytics and all, it is completely different. Yes, still we are looking on to the same age old historical thing. Yes, as you told, even I have a strong opposition when we speak about the historical things, when we speak about the uh, evolution of uh, uh, journalism in India, still people are still universities do have those kind of a things which has to be uh, redesigned or which has to be cut short with only uh, certain historical things has to be shared. And you also spoke about how flexible these Western universities are, whereas when it comes to the Indian counterpart, we are more rigid. We are not able to give up with the certain things. And we are still I hope I have not annoyed people there. <laughs> no, no, it's not like that because that is the main the main purpose of this kind of seminar is to open up the ideas and we also want to know how things can be changed, how we can even match up to the global thing because one of the NEP also speaks about how we can take up the global challenges. So when people like you, you come across and you speak about the things and how we are making the students industry ready, it doesn't mean that we are not trying our level best. But still, as you told, there are a lot of lacunas, there are a lot of loopholes where we speak about the infrastructural thing, maybe it's related to the technological development. There are certain universities where there are no computer labs, there are no uh, television studios, but still we run media education courses. So there are certain drawbacks, there are certain loopholes which needs to be done. And one important thing uh, I liked it is about the teachers should be placed in the media industry for a proper training so that when they go to the industry, they know what is happening and they come back to the class they can carry back certain things and they can impart the same to the students. Uh, all these points are well taken and hopefully our uh, attendees will also have a lot of questions to you at the end of the discussion. And uh, once again, thank you, Seema, for thank giving you us so much. Uh, Thanks lot a lot of for uh, inviting me. I really and appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. The next uh, panelist would be uh, Professor uh, Sanjeev, uh, Sanjeev, uh, who is an HOD with uh, uh, HOD in the Department of Journalism, Marlon Velas College, Sidhumanantapuram. And just to give you a bio, he'll be speaking on higher education in media and opportunities. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev SR is, been, is an experienced uh, prof uh, assistant professor uh, with the uh, Tirunandapuram College and also has been a media professional before entering into the world of academics. And he has got a strong forte with uh, uh, broadcasting, storytelling, visual communication and communication research. Uh, his uh, area of interest include development communication, public finance, economy, politics and cinema. And he has also uh, he's been a, uh, he also holds a diploma in broadcast journalism from Thompson uh, Foundation Cardiff. And I welcome Dr. Sanjeev to give his thoughts on higher education in media and opportunities. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev. Dr. Sanjeev, you are there. No, I, uh, I think I'm audible. I'm loud and clear. Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Speak right. a bit louder. And you okay. have got 10 minutes. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, Professor Sapna Nai. The time uh, limit is 10 and, minutes. Uh, respected uh, Vice Chancellors, uh, Professor Karpaga Kumaravil, Professor K.G. Suresh, uh, respected panelists, Dr. Purnananda, uh, uh, Professor Seema Sangra, Dr. Nandini Lakshmi Kanta, Dr. Mohammed Hanif. And uh, I am extremely thankful to Reva University Bangalore and uh, Professor Manjunatha for giving me this opportunity to talk about NEP and its uh, uh, and what opportunities and challenges that uh, it has been giving us uh, in terms of media in uh, taking forward the media education in India. Since we, uh, we don't have much time, I am uh, going straight to my presentation. I request to put up the slides or PowerPoint presentation by the organizers. The, uh, I think it is coming, it is not coming. No, you haven't shared still. Manjunath, sir? Uh, sir, 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 I'm doing it, sir. I'm doing it. Okay. Okay. Sanji, we have 10 minutes. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to respect yeah. myself. Okay. I can understand, but still. Uh, I think uh, it's a 15 minute, but anyway, I'll try to respect myself. Sure. Okay. Uh, this is. Uh, let us begin uh, with the prevalent uh, discussions that is happening in the media education uh, uh, media education scenario in India. Ever since the advent of uh, media education or specialized study in mass communication, the issue of gaps between theory and practice has been discussed and deliberated without much tangible results. Have been made on the quality of output in media research, which has been approached as a bridge 
in closing the gaps between theory and practice. The debate on whether media education is part of an on-the-job activity or whether it is an attribution of specific skill sets with background knowledge is unlikely to be concluded in the near future. The process of framing the mass communication curriculum is beset by uh, difficult questions such as uh, whether it should be confined to the theories of mass communication uh, and principles of journalism and essential traits of allied subjects such as advertising, PR, mass media management, etc. Or should it expand its scope to other disciplines such as history, politics, economics, cultural studies, arts and aesthetics, etc. Whether we should emphasize knowledge and skills in content or focus on technologies that make the content more consumable is another issue that gains currency in this discussion. And the, uh, the next slide, please. In all such uh, broader issues, we find answers in the middle between the extremes. For example, we advocate synergic interaction between theory and praxis, collaboration with industry along with academic pursuits, inclusion of liberal arts subjects clothed in mass, communi mass communication vocabulary, and provision for technical know-how with the nuances of content making, etc. But students are stranded with half-baked academic as well as professional capabilities. Therefore, asking critical and relevant questions that are necess necessitated by the context will be an important step in addressing issues related to mass communication education and search for critical media pedagogy. Such questions will evolve out of an analysis of prevalent information and media ecosystem and concepts of uh, mass communication. Next slide, please. Much has been talked about digital dis disruptions in me uh, trans uh, traditional media forms and mass communication practices. It has undermined the top-down top bias of information provisions of mass communication by transforming the process of intervention, mediation, and hierarchy. In traditional norms, mediation is conducted by journalists, opinion makers, leaders, etc., and the message is subjected to intervention by them. Strong hierarchy prevails in this process since the mediators assert their views on their original message. But in digital networks, not social networks, I am asserting, I am underlining this point. Receivers are de-anonymized and the process limits mediation or persuasion and often surpasses the technological boundaries set out by the power structures. It gives a sense of uh, freedom and autonomy to individuals who participate in this process through its inherent str strength of interactivity and modifiability. Although there are filter bubbles and echo chambers in play in digital networks, they sometimes break away from the hierarchies of traditional mass communication process. Now the fourth slide. Uh, here we have to rethink the traditional concept, uh, concept or definition of mass communication and attempt to redefine the process within the matrix of digital media systems. Here it can be defined as the continuous and evolutionary triggers of messages which spurred from all possible outlets, not necessarily in a coherent form but adapting, modifying, and appropriating at every reception point and proliferate in networks with contextual connotations and impact on receivers in an altogether different frame of reference from that of the originating source. Now, can we move on to slide six? As uh, let me quote Stuart Evan, news today is a process of participation and relationships. It is not just a set of messages, message systems, or a commodity. Alvin Toffler, uh, let me quote, there are no longer consumers or producers of me media messages. Instead, we can see prosumers, product producers plus consumers of media. The linearity of information dissemination has been replaced with circular and globular modes of message diffusion wherein individual is subjected to information overload or infobesity. And in this disease period, it transforms to infodemic. This is the media that we are dealing with in the digital scape. Are we empowered enough to deal with this situation? It is an emphatic, emphatic no. And uh, next slide, please. Therefore, I think it is some important to understand the complexities of convergent media systems and nuances of media production, dissemination and consumption in order to tackle the larger question of media and mass communication education future. Uh, some aspects, let me share some aspects of convergent media sphere in this regard, just to highlight the point. The traditional concepts, uh, can I have slide seven, please? The traditional concepts of news values should give emphasis to perspectives and reliable forecasts, verified and contextualized messages, data reading, analysis and synthesis, and so on. 
the new arena and its factors will always be there in the digital sphere but they have to encounter more demanding and challenging consumer aspirations the process of news gathering will be more intense where in personal anecdotes interpersonal interactions eyewitness accounts etc gain more traction now can we move on to uh, slide 9 because uh, okay in this slide uh, i am talking about uh, the critical view towards treating mass communication in isolation uh, some scholars are of the view that since the broader study discipline is communication there should be a holistic approach towards its pedagogy and uh, practice however i think we should confine our discussion to mass communication alone it is umbrella term that encompasses journalism audio visual communication advertising etc the principal theoretical approach history and norms that guide each of these areas have a common thread which can be located in mass communication theories and methodology but our existing pedagogy often fails to identify this thread and treats individual themes in, comp in a compartmentalized way for example while we engaging in the process of teaching learning of journalism principles and practice we often fail to read and synthesize the rich literature on audience medium and effect theories of mass communication uh, i have given other examples as well i am skipping that uh, now next slide please uh, the teaching learning uh, slide number 10 i uh, yeah. have the teaching learning process of mass communication is often formalized in nature it attempts to suggest formulae for news reports advertisement designs we are campaigns etc in an extremely super, superficial manner for example we talk about if we uh, be for exclusives or human interest story in our classrooms and prescribe constituent elements of these terms and we are also giving examples to take this uh, point home but this discussion should also progress to the realms of critical thinking identifying and the, the not so obvious facts the atmosphere that led to the human interest elements in the story the immense possibilities of telling these stories etc i think the teaching learning process in this sense will grad should gradually shift its priorities towards learning teaching here teacher has a significant role uh, in which she has to uh, learn for, uh, first and then she has to uh, she or he has to try to transact and uh, now slide 12 please the challenges of mass communication in digital scape uh, to redraw the canvas of mass communication education in digital era it will be appropriate to visit revisit the prevalent concept as an illustrative example uh, let me take gate gatekeeping as an example because i think this is an important aspect that i am trying to uh, tell the attendees we are all familiar with the gatekeeping theory in mass communication that was enriched by contributions of third living david manning white bruce ashley and malcolm malcolm mcclean it highlights the journalistic process of selection of news based on ambiguous parameters and the significant role of this process in following norms that strengthen values suited to modernity and democracy but we are critical of digital network led information system about their near absence Uh, of uh, uh, we uh, also hold critical view about the absence of editors in the so called social networks and worry about their destructive interventions in our social fabric but here we miss an important opportunity to cultivate a number of key keepers who are active in such networks if an active audience member can become a producer or consumer of information he can also be an efficient gatekeeper provided he is armed with media literacy and news literacy this aspect opens up scope for wide spread mass communication education programs that empower people from various walks of life with media and, and news literacy now to 13 but to make use of such opportunities academics of media education should update upskill and understand the networks and their operations in society in depth this may require unlearning and relearning of our lessons to make sense of the transformations in media system the pandemic necessitated uh, the provision for digital citizenship for all irrespective of digital divide information access technological know how etc however digital citizenship cannot be mechanically provided by government or institution it should be critically addressed with issues such as knowledge gap or information divide political economy of information provision and equity in digital space against this backdrop mass communication academics and professionals need to play an active role in ensuring access equity and bridging the information divide 14 slide 
let me come to nep nep uh, the court has already been given by the earlier speaker it, it is visible in the the major aspect of this court is critical thinking and multidisciplinarity innovation uh, the core idea of next, next slide please the core idea of this policy document national education policy document is to increase the chances of vertical mobility seek avenues to tackle problems with the help of tools available from multiple and allied disciplines and intellectual progression from the planes of understanding and remembering to application and creativity uh, although mass communication professionals are dealing with politics public finance law etc uh, uh, the deeper domain knowledge is always uh, been acquired through on the job assignments this adversely affects the quality and output of professionals at least in their early stages of careers careers such backlash may deter them from continuing in the profession for a longer period nep gives us an opportunity to address this issue a student with an aspiration to specialize in business or politics may well uh, may be well equipped with domain knowledge offered by the chances of vertical mobility for this purpose we may have to access accept double or triple majors in graduate level education or may offer pg programs with emphasis on sub such subjects another way is to have flexible electives and projects that enable a student to become a specialist in a particular field this requires co learning by the teacher and student in order to find solutions for the study discipline next slide another aspect of nep is its thrust on multi multi disciplinarity in higher education multi disciplinarity refers to work on a given problem by different disciplines with their own tools and methodology to find a common solution but interdisciplinarity is something slightly different it is a step ahead where in different disciplines work together and seek interrelated methodologies to find answers let us consider digital humanities as a case to understand the subtle difference digital humanities incorporates digitized both born and remediated materials and combines the methodologies from traditional humanities disciplines such as rhetoric history philosophy etc Uh, with tools provided by computing such as data visualization data mining digital mapping ai etc such engagements and interactions between disciplines offer novel ways of doing research and finding solutions and increasing the speed of knowledge dissemination thus it can be both multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary in nature similarly mass communication can have conversation with not only humanities and social science but also with pure science as well Uh, with the help of data modeling and advanced computing technology as the previous speaker has explained data scientists have developed algorithms that can trace and locate emotional quotients in messages traversing through networks this has been helpful in fact checking and myth busting of social media messages during and before covid 19 emphasis on multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity offers an excellent opportunity to take forward mass communication research to areas that are unexplored previously it calls for an eclectic approach for which restricted uh, which is not restricted by notions of uh, i think empiricism and uh, abstraction let me conclude by highlighting four points next slide please uh, there is a dire need to revisit the prevalent concept of mass communication in an evolving digital information sphere where intervention mediation and hierarchy are questioned by interactivity modifiability and autonomy of individuals in a society second point is approach towards practices of media and mass communication should be multimodal conversational and creative in order to address the evolving aspirations and value systems of modernity and democracy however onslaught of emerging digital technology should not deter from the core ideals of media and mediation which are hinged on egalitarian humane and empathetic standpoint mass communication education should make use of the chances of vertical mobility and multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary engagement in order to strengthen its capacities in addressing emerging societal problems through rigorous research and suggestions for innovative practices in sum mass communication in education in future may not necessarily address the mass but the individuals in mass massive networks and it may embrace the practice of learning teaching rather than teaching learning with critical thinking at its center thank you very much thank you dr
Dr. Sanjay for highlighting the things and uh, your talk mainly highlighted on how important about the theoretical theory as well as the practice and how uh, important is the convergence kind of a thing. And also you spoke about the critical thinking, which is one of the core thing of this NEP. Uh, um, um, most because of the paucity of time, we'll be taking the questions at the end and also we I'll be winding up and also speaking about the presentation at the end. Now the next uh, speaker of the day would be uh, Professor Nandini Lakshmikanta. Uh, professor Nandini Lakshmikanta is a professor and the former director uh, working at uh, Manipal Institute of Communication, uh, constituent of uh, Manipal Unit of uh, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. She has uh, experience of uh, 20 plus years in the academics and also has served at the various educational institutions. Basically, a very good researcher as I've known her for quite a number of years. She's been into a lot of research and also has completed many major projects to her credit. Uh, one of her projects is about effective health communication methods among uh, young women and exploratory study on RTI and SIT. And she has also been working on road safety management, uh, which has been sanctioned by the Indian Council of uh, Medical Research. And uh, she has also been working with augmentation employable skills among BA students, a study on Bangalore University and also reproductive health among uh, uh, young women issues and challenges in her research. She has also authored that particular book. She was also a recipient of a dad uh, scholarship, DAAD dad, that's Germany. Uh, she visited India 2015 where she has delivered a lot of public lecturers on the issue related to uh, India and during, uh, during the universities there. And in 2017, she was uh, invited in the universities of Kentucky, San Jose, Florida at the United States to deliver lectures on health communication and Bollywood blockbusters. She has also published her research papers in Scopus Index journals and presented papers at the various international conferences. And I look forward uh, uh, for her uh, presentation. And today she'll be speaking on role of media educators. Uh, yeah, over to you, Nandini. Uh, thank you, Sapna. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon. It's my privilege to be part of this uh, national symposium organized by Reva University, and I appreciate all the efforts initiated by Manjunath and his young team. And uh, honestly, it's an advantage and disadvantage to be a tail ender. Uh, of course, Hanif being one more in the end, most of the thoughts are already mentioned by the esteemed co-panelists. However, uh, with uh, probably what I'm trying to do is kind of um, talking mainly, I don't talk, I don't want to talk on anything else, but mainly on the role of uh, media educators. <clears throat> so with the national policy, education policy being revisited after 34 years, it is uh, definitely a right time to take the stock of stock on what's happening in media education and uh, which is a century old in India. And uh, so when I say the topic is apt, let's move forward as uh, India moves forward towards becoming a knowledge economy and more and more young Indians are likely to aspire for higher education. As mentioned in the national education policy, the education they receive, be it media or otherwise, any other field should match the requirement of the 21st century. So keeping this in mind, NEP or no NEP, it is uh, time to rethink about the role of uh, media educators in media education. Interestingly, uh, media being a technology driven and changing media scape being volatile by nature, there is always a big demand uh, for the academia, uh, by, I mean academia to meet the challenges of the industry. And the challenges uh, are thrown by the, uh, the the challenges that are thrown by the industry. It it is uh, it has to you know to map up with that the media education has to cope up with its content. So the question is uh, now is with the with the present state of mind uh, we have and the restrictions we have particularly that okay it's very easy for private university to revisit revamp uh, the syllabus but yeah, how but majority of the chunk 
uh, of students also study in public university. So how can they cope up with the changing uh, situation? Uh, so before we explore on the challenges and opportunities with reference to media education in India, let's take a quick look at some of the key points, key words that are used in national education policy. And we and I'm sure we find them suitable for media education. Uh, uh, things like, you know, I'm uh, appalled by words like creative individuals, set skills, knowledge creation and innovation primarily i am i am attracted by these a uh, few words in any mentioned in nep as uh, nep is looking at a greater opportunity for training students not just for employment as an individual but also to provide employment to others itself is a challenge towards uh, to um, challenge which media educators and media education is uh, should be facing the, um, the and other keywords like you know cognitive skills uh, which details about core skills the brain uses to think read learn remember reason and pay attention so uh, as a teacher how good are we in in tackling or tapping this core cognitive skills among students is again an introspection that need to be made. The purpose of um, obviously we all know that the purpose of higher education should be to develop good thoughtful and well rounded create individuals fine. We are all putting our best foot forward in doing so, but the purpose of higher education um, is uh, is it should not be only uh, tailor made for employment. There has to be an you know um, uh, some values, some ethics also involved. Looking at the present um, media uh, media and the employees working in the same um, in different media genre. At times, I mean, with me in being in education field for last 20 years, I wonder is these the students whom I taught or people like me have taught my seniors are there. I have my uh, guide, my senior teachers, they're all there. At, but the way they behave, the, the agenda setting theory, which they practice so profoundly, I wonder are, are they the same students who have taught whom we have taught ethics values in our classes. So what is our role then in in um, uh, in such a situation? What is our role then? One one is that that introspection we need to do. The second in, in introspection which we need to um, also make is uh, like many of my colleagues in the panel uh, mentioned that uh, uh, today the traditional um, uh, means of employment is is uh, not just the uh, thing which we need to talk or think uh, it is not just print industry many of the newspapers are dying so uh, if you just train them in journalism print media suitable for print media so where will they get employment like one of my colleague also mentioned, yeah, you have you are teaching only uh, history of Doordarshan and radio. If we are just to teaching that, uh, how will we? Um, uh, because uh, you know, employment in Doordarshan and um, radio is government owned, and even that is kind of seized. And we all, we are those who are associated with radio, television, we know that they are, they are uh, uh, with the minimum staff, majority of the chunk being on the verge of retirement, they are not recruiting any new people. Uh, so with the minimum staff, they are trying to manage the studios. So with uh, that uh, radio, uh, the private re radio being the uh, um, the only avenue for uh, students who have taken radio as a specialization, who love to use their voice, who love to work on radio, then 
you know the syllabus should be trimmed to uh, suit the uh, community radio or uh, commercial radio uh, fm stations so how much are we including uh, uh, all those techniques in our syllabus of course i'm i'm 100% sure i being uh, coming i'm i've been working only in private university uh, till date uh, so i know very well that private universities to a great extent are capable they are doing this job in including mic we have a wonderful um, a faculty padma kumar who is uh, exclusively doing with commercial radio so uh, so that is that's something and we also have a community radio nevertheless but I, i'm not just talking about one private university i'm i'm talking about there are many private universities many public university and as uh, uh, suresh sir said we are celebrating 100 years so where are we standing is uh, the question so then today when you look to the job opportunities that are available for a media student he can be placed as a, a business analyst he can be placed as a content developer he can be a web designer he can be an online journalist he can be into digital marketing advertising music manager rj what all so many and then he can also be okay i don't want to uh, work for any organization i am good with my television skills i can be a corporate documentary maker i can produce films right and i can uh, being a film pr producer or director i can also make documentaries for film so uh, how are uh, how how uh, and all these uh, and the list with uh, the opportunity which they have is endless so at this juncture it is essential for us to understand how equipped are we and if we take a um, quick look at the content then probably instead what i thought is you know i will talk to you people about every university every um, uh, thing but understanding the constraints of time i just want to tell you people yesterday um, uh, communication today a new uh, has brought out its uh, new journal it's a centenary um, um, edition in which um, San professor sanjeev banavat has uh, compiled papers on media education in different states of india so when i went through the challenges i just went to it just yesterday i have received and i was just going I, i'm also one of the authors but nevertheless i was just going through the challenges and keeping this particular uh, lecture in mind or this uh, symposium in mind the most of the things are very common every media educator is posing the same challenges almost so when i bifurcate them i will i can clearly divide them into two section one is academic and the second one is practical challenge so the when you look to the academic challenge a majority of public universities across india and definitely every department every university has a media department and the prestigious colleges which were you know which are in demand uh the ranking of the best ranking universities they are all into um, autonomous status or deemed to be university status so near uh, even when you look to the popular uh, uni uh, colleges they have now become a uh, private universities and uh, they have uh, every uh, nearly 85% of the uh, deemed universities or private universities have media department so when you look to this the the um, uh, like now when you look to the scenario again like media is competing for its trp and ratings and uh, all other uh, thing media schools are also facing the competition right students join institute or college which provides them maximum scope for hand, hands on training you have studio do you have studio do you have radio studio uh, 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 when can you give me camera and before i give them camera they already are moving around with drone so they only come with high profiled camera i mean in in uh, institute like manipal students only come with um, uh, high profiled camera high highly high high resolution cameras 
So in in such an inst when they have such an instance, what are we giving again? Right. So uh, similar to uh, um, I mean, when you look to all the departments, if I make a concise uh, report on all the departments, um, we uh, the 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 stage uh, when we look to the uh, functioning, uh, every to every department brings out a journal. Every department, some institution encouraged to build, uh, bring uh, journals which are uh, students initiated with or without faculty being involved in the production, right? Um, of course, one uh, official journal is there. So all departments, irrespective of uh, private, public, everyone does it. So what is your specialty? Then next one. There is an, an um, uh, but one thing, yeah, the Professor Purnananda talked about research. So, but there is no institute which, yeah, uh, uh, no institute or institution which promotes research journals from students. However, it was practiced in Bangalore University in the initial stages. But uh, I don't see any student initiative towards research because research is one of the uh, predominant area which NEP talks about. And um, yeah, um, of course, there are institutions like many private institutions encourage uh, students to publish their journals, participate in conferences. All those things are secondary, but uh, the, the, does the institute it's a one as an academic, we are all very academic by nature. One as an academic um, thing, do we only our institution? How many of our institutions publish or bring out repute journals, repute research journals and how forget about students? Uh, we as a faculty ourselves, how many of us are contributing towards bringing out research general journal from our um, uh, organization and um, it's when we say research uh, we have to understand one one thin line of difference is there we have uh, not, not all the faculty will have orientation towards research say i think uh, my colleague from dubai mentioned about it uh, some are into television some are into animation right they have interest in those areas um, they they are into production so if you insist on them because research being the primary parameter and uh, if you are uh, insisting an animator or a um, animation teacher faculty or a television production faculty to publish a paper probably they will be in they will not be as capable as a theorist would be a person uh, a faculty who teaches theory subject and the uh, the person who teaches practical subjects there is definitely a difference in orientation so the nep's research should be can we or can we suggest uh, to the universities that if a faculty makes his presentation you know he goes to ife or international film festival makes stands as an example to his uh, students by producing a film or um, you know uh, producing an animated film or some such thing then uh, that can be considered as research i'm i'm sure uh, one or two universities have already taken this initiative i wish uh, more and more uh, to more and more uh, faculty should get involved more and more university should uh, think in these lines i guess and then it is um, uh, yeah um, we, we may say no we don't have time how many of us contribute to newspapers how many of us have blogs how many of us uh, make podcast all these things are question marks right uh, okay we may say no no we are only academic by nature uh, then uh, we, we we don't want to uh, involve ourselves in all these things because it doesn't give us any promotion or it is not included. Then my question is again, how many of us are involved in preparing ourselves for MOOC or SWAYAM classes? How many of how many of us have our name uh, production in these? So again, see we may argue 
and counter argue argument goes on but what is our credibility what is our strength are we really exploring or uh, are we really putting our best foot forward is definitely a question and uh, yeah uh, then another thing which comes to my mind is um, we have most of the colleges may most of the universities uh, we all have uh, uh, studios now may, uh, uh, like my colleague said Uh, let us not talk about the investments made on uh, building the infrastructure but you have a studio how many of us encourage our students to, on day to day production do we say that every day in youtube channel at this hour there should be a news broadcast i will i will sit and evaluate i'll sit in front of you at that hour and i want you people to do it do we do we say like that or we just say ha huh, you people do it and let go so these again our own credibility and our own commitment to um, the uh, the job which we are holding so yeah and uh, again as i said some of us have institutional radio some of us have community radio but how many of us again how many of our students are getting involved in program production and how many of you as a, we as a role model we are producing programs uh, for uh, our own community radio or our own uh, educational radio yeah so these are um, uh, we we uh, actually organize all all universities as as a matter of fact we organize media um, lectures from media specialists we organize seminars we organize conferences and uh, internships yeah somebody mentioned about internships all these things are being done but what how how can we be different is only by virtue of involving ourselves in the field getting that that skill orientation skill is something which we need to stress and work on now as i said it can be divided into two section the other one uh is practical challenges what practical challenges we face is if you go by the general rule book book uh, there is a gap between the academics and the industry it exists in all the fields and it is predominantly observed in media education very vast very the gap is widening unfortunately the gap is widening uh, in um, in uh, when you when we uh, when we uh, take a, our own uh, if we take feedback from our own students we find it so then and and uh, yeah like uh, i agree with my colleague from amity university unlike in western universities a majority of faculty members in india we lack a uh, practical exposure in the related field so uh, 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 i mean why why we shouldn't go for internship why uh, why we should uh, not uh, be allowed our one of uh, you see it need not be institutional compulsion one one semester when uh, semester break four uh, weeks two weeks let's uh, why why we not take that initiative and go and sit in a media house we also will write we want to intern with in area in in the area in which we are specializing can we not do that i think we can we don't need to any institutional support to us we don't need any you know may all we need is a letter from our principal or vice chancellor i think any university where there are two vice chancellors yes they'll happily give us those letters and then um, yeah this calls for the the change trend changing trend should happen now it is high time and most of the colleges universities at the undergraduate level they offer it as a bouquet uh, a journalism as one of the subject so one it should be made as an compulsory honors degree in all the all the universities and then otherwise start offering bivoc uh, courses uh, ujre has done that in karnataka ujre has done one it offers two types of program one Uh, it offers as a regular uh, ba program where journalism is offered as one of the combination with so many uh, blah blah three subjects and in another 
they have also established bivoc of course all private universities we all uh, offer uh, um, honors degree so uh, private universities it may not be a problem and then it's a skill based in, in industry as we repeatedly say this the faculty of television and uh, animation department uh, should be as i have already mentioned they should you should make we should make it a point that we produce a, a video or we uh, animate uh, in, uh, something and you know uh, we we make our own broadcast and again when we say this uh, even the uh, those who uh, the the all the institutions which give electronic media as specialization also how many students publish their uh, project how many projects are available on youtube again you know they are done they are stored they are evaluated by their faculty probably yeah so this initiative should be taken by the uh, respective faculty i guess and then um, uh, uh, the other uh, problem is negligence towards uh, providing professional status to media education even after a century we all proudly say in india we are century old education is century old but media uh, industry is continuing to accept uh, creative hands uh, without media education as that person's background so a lawyer has to be from the legal field an engineer has to be from engineering a doctor has to be from that an agricultural um, msw you cannot enter but media anybody can enter why are we still not attain this professionalism who who should be held responsible for all these things is my next question then i mean in the sense i want media teachers to think about this media departments should think about all these things right unless we are all united the teachers are all united we all put our uh, you know you, you are unitedly and forcefully say industry hello we are giving competitive people to you our students are uh, skilled they are trained right they suit your industry take them uh, the, then i think the industry will oblige then the third challenge uh the, the next i don't know how many challenges i have uh, posed for the media faculty the um, uh, the th the next challenge is uh, uh the technical difficulties that is the uh, the technology is growing so fast and i though i have an out of state studio the investment i have made it it becomes outdated soon right next year i the same equipments may look uh, uh, out of uh, date like you know every 6 months you have to change your mobile so uh, the, that is again a challenge which uh, majority of us are facing and revamping i i talked about revamping the syllabus but like you know university like akkama hadevi university women's university what they have done is along with um, their uh, post graduation degree they also give two skillful skilled um, uh, skill based diploma or uh, certificate course to their student they have made it mandatory so on video production and i i don't remember the other one but they make it compulsory so students who uh, study um, uh, then uh, usual ma uh, degree they also are trained they are skilled now so such initiatives bring a lot of validation and then uh, among the uh, many uh, problems uh, we face focusing on the language in methodic sense uh, i think suresh sir or somebody mentioned about it um, about language what uh, what is the 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 phonetics or the pronunciation or the local language awareness of the local language all these things uh, 
uh, matter a lot. So um, even when you look to the um, uh, cognitive skills uh, where uh, they demand uh, sustained attention or uh, enhancing the working memory, the method of processing the information quickly, all of you all have mentioned about it. So um, when when we revamp the syllabus, uh, all my dear faculty members, when we revamp the syllabus, I, which is necessary, uh, how much how much ever uh, curriculum the task could be, it is necessary because we need to move towards professionalism. If we do not move to professionalism, then the entire essence of media education is lost. So uh, we need to sit over and when we re revamp, revisit our syllabus, we have to look to the industry. So NEP or no NEP, I strongly uh, feel initiatives should be included in media education, not only for the benefit of students, but also for the faculty members. Uh, we need to get ready for the change. If we don't take the first step, then we are lost in this uh, uh, in this competitive era. Like uh, uh, with more universities now, NEP advises many universities going multidisciplinary. There is wide scope for including communication in fashion, health, sports, food, hospitality. I'm just last making. Last the last, last yeah, 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 I'm done. I'm done. Uh, uh, so let's understand the reason. Uh, I, I remember at this juncture, I remember Epen uh, when uh, one of the frontier, frontiers of uh, media education um, who, who's, uh, who 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 gave a nomenclature uh, to media education as communication department. So. Uh, I think uh, this uh, should uh, happen. The communication should be the sun. The communication yes. department should be the sun of all the departments and um, other other departments should re revolve around it. I, I hope this uh, dream of mine comes uh, true before I retire. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nandini, uh, for a very elaborate one and uh, especially on the very much needed topic as about it's about the media educator. And I know being in uh, 30 plus years of experience in academia, you'll have a lot to say. And even the points what you gave, which spoke about uh, the self retros retrospection about uh, of a teacher, media teacher and how you can initiate new things because it is a subject which keeps evolving. It's not like the same kind of history teacher who speaks about Tipu Sultan died in the end of 17 and you can't repeat the same kind of the thing. You need to upgrade yourself. And yes, it is very much needed uh, in the present time and the academic challenges, what we have, the practical drawbacks, what we have. At the same time, we also pointed out certain things where you said about investing on time, how much of the faculties are ready to sit even after the college hours to evaluate the assessment of a student. How many of us can uh, give our best and also see that how the students have been uh, uh, getting involved in a lot of activities and I, a uh, lot of things you spoke, especially can be related to skill based, getting an internship. I also speak, I also think that one way we need to evaluate ourselves and even it should not be restricted only for the point like we have a career advancement scheme where you do a specific number of courses, specific number of uh, training program just for the sake of the promotion. It is about the intellectual assessment which needs to be done and not only in terms of uh, the year of service or so because these kind of things is what very much needed for a media educator if you want to have a very long lasting subject especially want to contribute to the subject development these kind of things is what very much needed i'm very thankful to you and hopefully we'll have a lot of questions because many number of uh, people who are there in the pan in the attendees are our teachers so we have the last presentation and we have uh, Dr. Mohammed Anif, uh, who is the assistant professor with the Department of Mass Communication, Pondicherry University. He will be speaking on scope of syllabus upgradation in media education, comparative analysis with Western thoughts. And just to brief you about uh, the bio of Dr. Hanif, he's been into teaching uh, media communication for, uh, for more than two decades. He has been uh, part of the electronic media and mass communication department of Pondicherry University. Prior to that, he has also been a uh, 
practical journalist who has worked with the lead uh, with the leading uh, uh, print uh, media houses such as New Indian Express as well as Hindu. He has also worked in the e-learning domain as senior instructional designer and the content ed uh, in IT firms. So his area of interest include digital culture, digital journalism, uh, algorithm bias and effects and subjectivities and technologies. And he also has been a part of the editing of an online open uh, open access journal, Communication and Cultural Review. Uh, Hanif, as you are the last person, I'm mm -hmm. sorry for the uh, taking up a lot of time, but I would like yeah. to stick your talk to six to eight minutes. Okay. okay. No, but that's too harsh anyways. In <laughs> fact, I came here at a time when it was, you know, the sun was off the center in the sky and now it is too light. Now it's too light. Yeah, uh, but I think, you. but I think it's not a too light zone for communication studies per se. Then yeah, I so, go ahead, go ahead. No yeah. issue. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks uh, you know, to um, Mr. Manjunath and uh, uh, the uh, team at uh, Reva University uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak to you uh, on a, a relevant topic and perhaps a contemporary topic, you know, and uh, uh, having said that, I must uh, tell you um, that, you know, the uh, my co-panelists, my senior co-panelists have already discussed a lot of things and uh, as someone said, like, you know, the tail enter will always have, you know, very little actually to engage with. Um, uh, so uh, I don't know if I should share a PPT. PPT doesn't have much except for, you know, a few, uh, you know, images. Uh, but if that's something that I should share and. Can you see the PPT? No, not yet, not yet. No, it's not okay. visible. All right. All right, so that's um, my topic. Yeah, yeah. Can you see that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's uh, probably a, 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 a longer topic, you know, perhaps, you know, scope for syllabus application. Um, I will actually restrict myself, you know, to uh, two parts. One, uh, I would uh, discuss, uh, you know, um, you know, how the Western curriculum has come to dominate, you know, the curriculum in India is one. And I'm not going to talk much about it because there is a lot that has been discussed and it's being still debated, I guess, and there are quite a number of articles around and uh, senior professors like, you know, uh, Professor Yadawa and Professor Sanjay and, you know, a lot of other professors have been discussing uh, this particular aspect, right, as to how we are going to de-Westernize, you know, communication studies and communication curriculum. Uh, <clears throat> so, I think, you know, this has been happening and this is how, you know, the global not perhaps, you know, seems to be uh, dominating, you know, uh, discourses and there is a hegemonic influence on, uh, uh, you know, uh, everything and th that includes, you know, communication also. And uh, you see how, you know, the South is almost, you know, hanging a bit uh, uh, low, right? And the influence of Global North has been unrelenting, you know. Uh, and so what we've done is seem to have borrowed, you know, these theories and concepts, uh, you know, perhaps uh, without appropriating the uh, context per se, but I think, you know, context matters a lot. So a lot of times, you know, we tend to forget the context. And uh, so that's how uh, most of the time uh, we, uh, um, I mean, find that, you know, all of this ends in a certain kind of a, a fiasco. So I think a close examination of all the syllabi um, in most of the departments would reveal that, you know, uh, we have included, uh, I mean, quite devoutly uh, the syllabi of, you know, the uh, Western curriculum. Uh, without much uh, scrutiny and examination, and I think you know that needs to be done. So, what is missing here is the, uh, the the intellectual production from the local context. You know, what is it that you know we are going to do with respect to, say, for instance, if I am in Pondicherry, uh, what in Pondicherry would I uh, be interested in studying? So, from a research perspective, for that matter, right? Rather than studying, you know, I mean, Facebook, Amazon, etc., and then glorifying, you know, these companies. Uh, that's just one way of doing research because you know if you're going to study the epistemy of PhD communication researches that have been carried out in the last decade or so, I think most of this uh, have been less critical of you know some of these uh, you know things. Um, and that is one side of the story. The other side is like you know what about local knowledges and local cultures? So what about the epistemy, right? So I think in then that context we need to change our orientation in order to uh, produce uh, forms of uh, knowledge, uh, you know. Uh, that are uh, highly localized, right? So I don't know, probably uh, I would be interested in, in studying the kind of uh, journals that existed, you know, 
uh, during the French colonial period in Pondicherry, which probably might reveal a lot of interesting stories, which somebody in you know Bangalore or Mangalore or you know, other part of uh, India uh, cannot study. So uh, that will be you know uh, quite interesting. I'm still you know talking about you know all of this uh, from you know uh, a theoretical, uh, conceptual, and research perspective. Uh, which is essential, I, I uh, feel. So in this context, I would like to also, you know, I mean, I'm not going to go deep into this book, but you know, just would like to talk, uh, you know, I mean, there's a book by Buandro uh, de uh, Souza uh, Santos, you know, from uh, Portugal. Uh, uh, he's, a, I guess, he's a Portugal a scholar, and uh, uh, he's written a book called Epistemologies of the South. What are the knowledges of the South? So he's probably talking about the global South, right? And he's saying, we need to strive for justice against epistemicide, you know. So there's a knowledge imposition and colonization that is taking place, you know, from the West and sometimes from the Eurocentric countries. And we need to uh, ward off. See, it's not that I'm uh, proposing a, 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 a trajectory wherein we have to um, oppose uh, Western thought or Eurocentric thought to the name. So that's not the idea. But how to integrate like you know how to reorient our art study of communication you know to our own you know local cultures you know, because i come from a rip and mingle village you know and so i know there's a lot that needs to be studied you know when it comes to you know rural communication so and much of this communication is also urban centric and that's one of the criticisms so what uh, this person the scholar says is that i mean we always tend to look at the world through the western lens so our understanding and our interpretation of the world is through the lens of you know the western you know world so we don't have our own interpretation of our own world right so even we tend to see the world that we live in here in our local cultures and spaces through the lens of the Western, you know, uh, theories and concepts and uh, sometimes even philosophies. Okay, that's fine. So that's something in which needs to change. And so we need to look beyond the West and so look for non-Western also, all right? Or rather uh, look at, you know, the way, uh, I mean, look at ways in which we, we you know, wherein we can sort of reconcile or, or, or fuse, you know, the Eastern and the Western, you know, ours and theirs. So something of, you know, that sort, rather than letting, uh, you know, uh, them uh, colonize our minds, much the way most of the television channels today in India are trying to colonize our minds, right? Uh, and when you said, because, you know, we need to go uh, get trained in industries, I'd like to go to Times now. Well, um, we understand that, you know, the uh, origin of media and, you know, communication, of course, you know, um, is, as, as one of the presenters, you know, from uh, Dubai, Professor Seema also mentioned uh, that we are at least about 50 years behind, you know, um, when it comes to France, and so it's the case, you know, when it comes to the USA, like, you know, so post-World War, like, you know, these disciplines uh, emerged. And uh, uh, as uh, Professor Rapovananda also mentioned, like, you know, uh, the, the scholars from, you know, Frankfurt School of Critical Theory also, like, you know, landed in the US and uh, they started, in fact, they seeded, I would say, you know, uh, the, the, the critical theory approaches, you know, in the uh, US. And so communication studies also, uh, 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 you know, took some uh, energy, you know, from uh, these uh, 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 contributions. Um, <clears throat> but in the process, I mean, so what I'm saying, yeah, the origin of the discipline can always, like, you know, we owe it to, you know, these countries. Maybe it's the West or it's in European countries, fine. We started a bit late, yes, but we did have our own cultures. So, for example, if we're talking about Pondicherry, as a, my, one of my professors, you know, would always talk about it. There was this 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 particular person, uh, you know, who was maintaining diaries uh, for the rulers uh, uh, then, and he was documenting, you know, everything. So, which almost was diary was equivalent to sort of a journal. All right. So, I mean, if at all you're you... moving the slides, Ani. No, 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 no. I have very yes, fewer yes. slides, so please okay, uh, don't depend on slides. I have only a few images, you know, to show. That's it. Fine. So, uh, you know, what happens is like, you know, when, when yeah, so, the, so if, if at all you want to understand the past, right, or you visit, want to visit the archive, I think journal, this diary becomes, you know, one of the key sources that you might want to visit, right, you might want to uh, look into. Uh, so I think that's something that needs to be, you know, studied. So there's, there's a bit of a historical approach that is also needed. So history is not a, you know, bad thing, as long as like, you know, we, we, just don't, it's because, you know, what is today becomes tomorrow's history. So what happened 10 years back was history, you know, is this history now? What happened 20 years back is history now? So I think, you know, all those histories need to be documented, but we have failed to document this on a regular basis, and that's missing. 
So it is on that note. Uh, so uh, this is Anni Besant, and I think you know uh, because Sim also talked about it. Uh, okay, so it's on that count. I would like to talk about this. You know, Dalit journals in colonial Madras, and this was published very recently. It was published on 17th October 2020 in Economic and Political Weekly, and this is a research done by. Dr. J. Balasubramanian, who is working as assistant professor in the media department in Madurai Kamaraj University, and he has done his PhD research, you know, from Madras Institute of Development Studies, and focused only on this. He's been trying to understand Dalit journals. What were these Dalit journals which were published, which existed, and then did not manage to survive, perhaps for a long time? And what are the factors, you know, that actually pushed them to the extent of folding up? So he has done a research and look at this time period, 1869 to 1943. Please tell me which department is talking about this, no, for instance. Okay, if not all departments, at least in Tamil Nadu, which department is talking about this particular history? And this is a recent, this is something recent. It has happened recently, right? So I think, you know, history is something that needs to be digged up. Otherwise, like a lot of histories will get buried. A lot of histories get buried. If you're not going to document as you know even uh, uh, professor uh, uh, previous professor mentioned uh, how journalism is functioning that, that there's no ethics and values etc so uh, today i don't teach my students you know what is journalism i teach what is not journalism because you know i i think that that's that's the best approach to do so there's nothing called what is journalism what is not journalism is what you know we're supposed to be teaching i think even this needs to be documented you know for the next uh, you know generation uh, otherwise, we'll be missing more on, like, you know, what actually happened, you know, uh, during uh, different uh, time periods. So I, I'm not saying, you know, history is something bad in the tradition. Yeah, maybe the extent, but then everything, you know, um, becomes um, history. Uh, <clears throat> and why is it that, you know, we need to actually uh, re refocus on, on, on our own local cultures and processes and the dynamics of our local culture? Because, you know, our economic and social and political conditions are completely different. And, uh, you know, we cannot actually borrow some model and put it here. Just, it's just not easy for some models to be brought in from somewhere and re-embedded here. Like the way, you know, media effects theory is one of these things, you know. And I don't think, you know, media effects theory is something that we can, you know, you know uh, uh, for, I, mean, and, I mean, borrow, uh, you know, quite loyally uh, because, you know, there's, there's a lot of things. So how do we actually establish our own originality, right? So that's the question that you know, we need to, uh, you know, think about. Or how, because I, we have certain, in our own certain, you know, originality and probably fuse it with them and therefore change it, you know, the way, or probably it might even end up in uh, uh, generating new theories as well, right? Uh, so it took a, some time, you know, for the West to realize this. So even the West was like completely focused on media, media effects and stuff like that. Uh, till, say, for example, you know, uh, Gayatri's work, you know, she came and said, uh, can the subaltern speak? And, you know, everybody looked around and said, oh, oh, who's that, right? So subaltern studies emerged, you know, for instance, like, you know, so, which means like, you know, even in our studies, you know, when you're talking about, you know, for example, media, we cannot actually universalize it, generalize it, saying like, this is one homogenous group. No, it's actually two different groups, actually. Right. There are some people who can have access to media, some who do not have access to media. I think, you know, there are a lot of these, you know, differentialities. Uh, and I think that's something in which needs to be taken into account. And after subaltern studies and then, you know, you know, the Western tradition started, you know, uh, changing a bit. And uh, I think, see, even subaltern st studies, I think it's, it's just foregrounded in, 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 in the practice of sati. Right. So Gayatri work is writing about this on the basis of that particular thing. But of course, she. Uh, does bring in uh, Jacques Derrida and, you know, uh, other uh, people. Um, so there is a very good example of like, you know, how this uh, concept of modernization and development, you know, cannot be studied uh, using a universal lens or a concept, right? And uh, we have uh, uh, learned that, right? I mean, they said like, if you have a lot of media organizations around and people will become, you know, literate, but we have different, you know, social conditions. Right. We have different economic conditions and uh, it's just not uh, possible, you know, just to have uh, a few of, you know, these media organizations to install at the nook and cranny of, you know, every village and then all people automatically start reading. You know, this is not that, you know, some uh, God is coming down and hugging them and asking them to read or whatever it is. Um, so the domination actually still continues and we have to understand that, right? The domination continues to the extent that, you know, for example, uh, even uh, Internet domain names 
uh, and uh, you know all are, are, are actually uh, decided by the US right so we I think India uh, China have been you know trying you know to actually uh, uh, find a place in this so they can also have say in it right but otherwise it is they who decide as to who I mean uh, so they are the one who are deciding you know whatever like India you want to have domain name uh, they decided I think it's uh, something starting with I I pack I something I forgot it um so uh, on the other hand um yeah i mean the other ones like you know for example in the western tradition they even would say that you know uh, mcdonald is something great but have you ever come across you know a, a wonderful book you know called how to read donald duck right which is written by matlot and another person matlot is a communication theorist from germany or uh, some 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 part of europe and uh, she, uh, these two people have written this work like you know criticizing the ideologies in donald duck right and which was banned in the us and so banning books i think you know uh, in the globe right now is is quite not very uncommon so the, the the point that i'm trying to establish is that we need to be loyal to local values reading western ideas from our perspectives right uh, so what to study so i think you know if you are in bangalore probably you might want to study something you know, which is which, which, which is germane, you know, which is something, you know, which concerns, you know, Bangalore, Bangalore citizens, a part of the community, all slum community, something of that, part, you know, kind. Um, you know, slum studies became very popular in Mumbai because, you know, uh, slums are, are, are quite, you know, pervasive, you know, there. So I think, you know, we need to then in this context um, understand. So it's not about learning skills, you know, it's about I'm just trying to find out, like, you know, on what topics do students produce documentaries? What are the kind of topics you know they touch upon? So are they aware of these topics? It could be anything from you know a quote unquote project or you know anything you know the the, the hundred you know uh, one um, uh, this thing. Um, I think uh, so. That's you know a, a, a key thing um, which you know I've been talking about. Um, so. This is, you know, the uh, first part. Like, you know, I think we need to study. Uh, I mean, family, ethnic, you know, ethnicity, religion, um, you know, our own communication dynamics. You know, uh, the subaltern groups here, uh, the the migrants here, and you know, the, 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 and T bench communication villages. So it's it's not that there is nothing, no phenomena for us to study. Please understand, India is filled with phenomena. Unlike other countries, other countries have fewer phenomena because we are culturally rich. So we have a lot of rituals. And we have a lot of cultural practices that are going on. And so people have a lot to study. And that's one of the reasons why even, you know, I mean, digital anthropologists who are working on communication, they come down. All right. Or people from Canada come down to study T bench communication in villages. All right. Communication. I'm talking about communication. And so I think these are local cultures, you know, that we need to be studied. And there are plenty of them. I think we as teachers should also be a uh, private to this, like and should be sensitive, you know, uh, uh, you know, to these uh, uh, topic, uh, to topics and uh, theories. Uh, and uh, I don't have to mention even, you know, uh, Professor Sanjay's, you know, 18th Elephant is a wonderful book, you know, which uh, was on uh, development communication and a very good metaphor, you know, called 18th Elephant. You know, please go and refer because uh, uh, I think that will be. Uh, you know, it, it's it's about, you know. Um, there are 17 elephants. The king had 17 elephants, and uh, that uh, these say 17 elephants had to be shared <coughs> among three sons. And the first son, you know, had to be given uh, something like uh, uh, one third or two third of the share. Um, and uh, you know, the um, uh, second son has to be given two third, and one the, the third has to be given one third. Actually, 17 elephants cannot be shared. Uh, because it will be like half and stuff like that. So as uh, somebody who passing by with an elephant and he, you know, says that he will help in, you know, he, he gives the elephant and makes, makes it 18 and then starts sharing and they get it like nine, six and two. So first son gets nine, second son gets six and the third son gets two. So it's like, you know, so 15 plus two, 17. Um, and the, the, the other elephant, like it doesn't belong to him. So the, you know, the, the, the man takes it away. And so here that one elephant is like a catalyst, right? And, uh, you know, that's the you know, story how he builds on this, you know, uh, development, uh, uh, the development project in, you know, uh, 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 villages, right? Uh, I think, you know, a lot of such stories, you know, and metaphors and, you know, folks, folk tales, you know, which, which, which connect with, you know, all these projects. So that will be, uh, I, I don't know if uh, this is something, you know, which is central to uh, Western uh, uh, culture. Right. Um, 
so that said, now I would like to see, like, you know, how can we integrate, you know, a uh, 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 curriculum, right? Uh, I mean, some of the new developments that have taken place, and you know, what are the ideas that have been proposed? I think, you know, most of the uh, uh, co-panel uh, members have already uh, discussed at length about, you know, this. Um, so in this context, even you know, when I was talking about uh, uh, the local cultures, uh, Professor Puran mentioned, you know, uh, Raymond Williams. Raymond Williams is from a Welsh. Place, you know, Welsh community. He's from a poor family. His father was, uh, you know, working at the railway station, and before that, he was working at the mill. And uh, you know, they are, uh, you know, from you know agriculture families. And all of these reflected profoundly in the works of Raymond Williams, right? And that's the stuff I think you know that we also need to incorporate. You know, when we are actually doing research or even producing documentaries, anything for that matter, right? And if at all you want to stand out and be unique, I think, you know, students, you know, from their respective places and geographies and communities should focus on, you know, events and phenomena that are taking place in these places, right? Now, how do we connect the, um, I mean, this, this, uh, I mean, I mean, de-Westernization, I mean, new education policy, so what are we discussing? So many of you have pointed out many things. So I'll just take, you know, only one strand of thought in this, and which is, you know where the uh, thrust is given to uh, technologies and you know digital technologies you know per se um so all of a sudden there is a thrust like so when i was doing my masters you know in mass communication i'm sorry communication i studied print media writing and reporting of print media media ethics culture society etc i had only a typewriter you know to type my dissertation uh, but you know today we're talking about in a lot more than that we're talking about studios and a lot of this infrastructure and digital technologies right uh, and so on and so forth, right? So talking about 360 degree journalism, VR and conversion media, uh, games and all of that stuff. Um, and following the NEP, I've been seeing a lot of advertisements, both in Facebook as well as you know, in, 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 on television, uh, that there is a, a call for you know this coding classes, like you know, kids who are in sixth standard can also enroll for these courses. So there's a push, you know, for the kids to um, get ready for, you know, the computational world is understand the computational world the digital world or what it was the computational world now i was just you know i was not amused by these advertisements in fact you know i was just wondering why on earth would should i learn a particular language at such a young age which only a computer can understand um, rather i would rather focus on languages you know which would be useful for me to communicate with my fellow human beings but okay but unfortunately what happens is a life world and a sociality uh, has changed a lot, which means I think, you know, a lot of our social interactions and all that stuff, I think, are predominantly taking place within digital spaces. And as a result, I think we need to understand there is a need for us to understand, you know, the relationship between human technologies and machines, you know, because they have sort of, you know, become uh, quite, I mean, intertwined, with, they become intertwined with each other. Okay. Um, so, but not at the cost of, uh, you know, uh, uh, glossing over uh, our mother tongue and uh, English, you know, because they are very essential, you know, to communicate and what other languages, you know, people might want to uh, learn. So what has happened is that, you know, the, the coding has uh, started uh, 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 picking up a lot. Um, so the one fact is like, you know, somebody mentioned that the world is filled with data, data science, data modeling, etc. Uh, data science and all that stuff. Uh, so what, was, what does that have anything to do with media sciences uh, or does that have anything with communication studies? Now, what if I'm going to say like, yeah, computational communication. Have you come across this discipline? Recently, like a year ago, there was an advertisement at the Singapore University, National University of Singapore, and even called for a professor who could handle computational communication, right? And there are a lot of PhD and PDF opportunities where they're expecting us to know, for example, Giphy tool and uh, um, data scraping and R, et cetera. So I think, you know, slowly uh, on the research side, I mean, let alone the fact that there is also on the, on the, on the, uh, I mean, industry side as well, and both on the academic side, I mean, in, I mean, in all, right, you know, there is a need for us to up train, up, up skill ourselves and, you know, digital skills are, you know, required. And so there is a complete uh, change that is taking place. So do we have to then incorporate and integrate a, a, a course on computational journalism. Yes, we are doing it, you know, we call it data journalism and visualization, etc. So when we're talking about data journalism, I still remember I, I had called a, 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 you know, a person, an expert from the Hindu 
to uh, uh, do a, a workshop on infographics. And he brought a, a person along with him who also works at the Hindu. And in fact, he said like he worked with the Infosys earlier. So he was an engineer. He's, he holds a BE and he works now here. He's doing data journalism. So he's using tools such as Tableau and other stuff. And uh, he's dealing with data, databases, pulling data from different, uh, you know, uh, 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 databases and putting together and giving you some information. You must have recently watched, you know, how uh, information related to political communication, I mean, elections were presented to us. So all these constituencies, you know, that map and each constituency represented in a, a different color, um, you know, and all of this is, uh, you know, so this is, you know, data journalism. There's some database. One of my colleagues here at the department is working on that. He's working on election database and he does all of this. He has learned R. He's 60 years old. He's learned it very recently. He did, uh, you know, I mean, underwent uh, uh, training also for that. So now what happened? So the, the question that arises is, OK, why is an engineer sitting at, you know, a newsroom, right? So, so far, like, you know, in a very traditional conventional sense, we always understood that, you know, industry is a place where only mass communication students can go into. Now here is a place like, you know, we also have computer programmers. So if automated journalism or use of bots or, you know, use of artificial intelligence, if there's anything to go by, like, you know, for example, the Guardian is using it, the New York Times is using it, and there are a lot of other uh, uh, third, so third party sources which are, you know, helping you know a lot of news organizations if there's anything to go by then what role do we have as you know journalists right you know i mean so do we have to tweak our journalism or is it that you know computer programmers would go in there and you know there's no scope for journalists right it's not like that i think you know there's scope for both but i think there is also this is also time you know where i think you know we need to uh, rethink in terms of uh, what else they can learn along with you know their so i'm not saying they should not learn how to write they should learn how to write. They should learn how to communicate, how to articulate, how to express in terms of language. And should also have a thorough understanding of the politics, history of the politics. They should, I mean, I would be amazed like if some, there's someone who can talk about the last five looks of elections. Yeah, so that's also good. And probably if this person can also have some familiarity with certain tools, then I think, you know, he's becoming somebody else. And you understand that, you know, you go to, because I've been doing research with my PhD scholars. Uh, we have done research on, uh, uh, I mean, newspapers, especially their digital newsrooms, and even digital startups, you know, digital native uh, organizations, like, you know, the Why the Quint, et cetera. And even here, like, you know, we've done a lot of, uh, you know, work, and we're trying to understand and you don't find anyone being called a journalist. I mean, the names are changing. All right. Uh, simply, you know, by the fact that, you know, you're expected to possess a different set of a repertoire of, uh, you know, skills. Right. So I think, you know, things are, uh, you know, completely changing. Um, and I, I must also give another example of one of my students uh, who, who whom I taught, you know, way back in 1998 and 2001. Uh, he did Viscom and then he went on to become a copyright and advertising agency. He worked there and used to talk about media, market, copy. I mean, all the time, whenever I used to get a call, I mean, when you get an opportunity to call him, he would say this. But now recently I met him and he has moved into, he has evolved and he's moved into what he call as bot development. He has got a, you know, a, a facility at Indonesia here in Coimbatore and a few other places. And now he talks about media, code and copy. So he's talking about code also, right? So I don't know in this context, then is there a need for journalists? I think you know we need to only rethink. There is a need for us, you know, to to to, to sort of uh, you know uh, learn a bit of coding also, maybe a bit of Python. I'm not saying like you know we have to go to the extent of you know. Certainly, I mean uh, news organizations will have people one or two who take care of you know all of this, but a certain understanding of the subject is required. Like you know the way I said, one of my colleagues is now into election databases and trying to predict elections based on, you know, the last five year elections or whatever, like, you know, he can now handle that and write, you know, papers. I'm also working on algorithms, all right? And I'm, we have a paper called Algorithms Cultures, also that's different. Uh, but I'm also learning how algorithms work, you know, what is ML and what is deep learning, all right? A bit of what is R, et cetera. So I'm not saying that everyone, you know, should get into this, but slightly the landscape of communication seems to be changing, but then, at the same time, I would say that you no, know, let's not give up on the critical aspect of it. So, um, you know, um, I'll come back to you know this. Uh, so, if at all, I, I, we have a you know we are offering a paper called algorithmic cultures. 
So, I mean, all of a sudden we wanted, like, why should I study algorithms? And I'm not going to teach quotes, etc. But there is a certain kind of a culture around it. There's a certain kind of biases. I think, you know, Coded Bias is a film which is, uh, you know, there in Netflix and you can watch, some of you already might have watched this. Now, this talks about bias. This talks about ideologies. This talks about bodies. This talks about race. This talks about subjectivities. Uh, this talks about a lot of things and identities also, right? So I also happen to review one of the books uh, by John Cheney Lippold, you know, from the university in the USA. Uh, we also had an interaction with him, you know, some time back. Um, so I think there's a, a lot, you know, that, you know, one could do. So I'm not saying that, okay, you should do this. But the fact that NDP is focusing on coding and stuff like that, if, you are, if at all you are looking at these words, where it is expecting us to combine skills, scientific temperament, and critical thinking, I guess if you want to understand this, right? So there are a lot of uh, schools in the US and other places which are offering this, all right? Uh, and there are a few people in India who have started already, you know, uh, working on this. So I, you know, would like to know how algorithms are playing a central role in, 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 in the journalism industry, right? Or in industry for that matter. Or uh, how do I study algorithms, Dalits, minorities, women for the, for the matter, from a feministic perspective in how the bias is actually encoded? So there are a lot of people who are talking about critical race theory and other stuff, you know, who are you know, studying this. So all of a sudden, then you, what are you seeing? You're seeing that there is a fusion of science and social science. This is what B Bruno Latour, you know, you know, in his act and book theory talked about it. So science and social science, you know, they are actually fusing. And this is what, you know, the NDP is also talking about in saying that, you know, uh, you, it, it should be uh, interdisciplinary, uh, you know, I mean, arts and, uh, arts and commerce and humanities and science can come together, vocation and academia, I mean, mainstream can come together. So these are ways in, you know, which uh, uh, I think, you know, uh, we can uh, um, look at. Uh, but at the same time, having you know, explain the fact that yeah, we need to learn a bit of this and that. You must also focus on the critical aspects of it. For example, as we are talking about today, digital technologies are not accessible to everyone. So we need to talk about that. We need to talk about digital divide. So I still remember, you know, an incident where one of the researchers, you know, um, was training uh, a, a set of uh, a village women on how to download and upload, you know, birth certificates and death certificates, how to download death certificates and birth certificates. And immediately one of the women asked this question, can we download a plate of food? Period. All right. No. All right. So that's that's period. Like, so I think we need to understand this. So this is going to help us understand what technology means to people. All right. So what technology means to people, I think doesn't have a universal functionality. No. So you need to understand when I go to a tribal community, I'm going to see that these people, they are going to understand, you know, the technology in a completely different way. So I think this critical thinking and critical approach is also essential. And we need to teach you know, students this. Students should never think that it's a homogenous community and cannot take it for granted that, you know, if it is mobile phone, it does this. No, a mobile phone could be a cup holder for somebody. You know, we don't know. We don't know. Right. So I think, you know, these cultural biases, these inequalities in terms of like, you know, how women are being able to use mobile phones, right, within households and outside, etc. So all of that need to be studied. So much the way, like, you know, I don't know how many of you have read this book, Why Loiter? Why Loiter is a book written by three famous anthropological scholars from Mumbai. It's a very famous book. You know, how can they, I mean, there is no freedom for women to loiter within physical spaces. And that's the same book. One needs to study if one wants to understand, you know, whether women can loiter within even digital spaces. Now, that critical thinking and critical approach is also necessary as I study how to do digital marketing, as I study how to do SEO marketing, as I study how to do SMM marketing. We are doing that, right? Or, I mean, the focus is now on what you call as uh, uh, learning to be, you know, conducted through uh, online mode. Or I worked in e-learning industry. Yes, you know, I mean, e-learning is quite popular and we are uh, depending a lot in the SWAM and uh, we are supposed to be producing a lot of courses and we are right now in the COVID pandemic time, we are teaching students um, online, etc., and so on and so forth. Yeah, but even there, I guess, like, you know, there are a lot of these critical approaches. I don't think, you know, we want to have a lot of Baijus coming and colonizing these spaces, right? I think, you know, governments must have, you know, considered these opportunities to produce uh, uh, alternative to Baiju and 
you know, make this content available, you know, to people who can't afford to pay for this content, you know, which Baiju is charging about some 60,000 uh, per year or more than a lakh, right? So can't, you know, go on. So if you are taking a project, so I think, you know, a group of 15, 20 academicians can, from IITs and other places, come together and take up a project and, you know, do something similar to Baiju an alternative solution to people who cannot afford. So I think, you know, there's this critical thinking that is needed as we are studying and upskilling ourselves, learning, coding, algorithms, etc. I think we also need to look at it, you know, from a, a critical uh, perspective. Uh, so that is also something, you know, which is very important. So uh, I'm always reminded of this, like, you know, um, you know, when you're talking about COSRA for that matter, COSRA is filled with, you know, a go-to place for data science courses today. You want to do some data science course, go to Costa, like, you know, or a lot of other, you know, portals. But what was earlier, Costa was a free uh, space, like, you know, open space, where you can go find out all courses, liberal arts courses, everything. What happened to all these liberal arts courses? I don't know. Costa, you know, signed a, an agreement with IBM, you know, because there's a lot of demand for data science. And they started producing only, you know, data science courses. And there's a lot of money now. They started charging money. And they have dropped all these liberal, you know, courses. So I think, you know, this is the other side of the coin when you're talking about, you know, e-learning. I think we also need to teach our students these critical aspects as well, so that they have a fair understanding of all of this, right? All facades of, you know, the issue. That's something, you know, which is, uh, you know, very, very uh, important. Otherwise, I think, you know, we have a greater scope. As I said, like, you know, computational communication, you know, studies is something becoming. And there is also a shift, you know, that is taking place in order to understand the relationship between, you know, I mean, human beings and digital technologies. There's a, a requirement, you know, on a part to engage with media philosophy, you know, which is also becoming philosophies of new technology. So all of a sudden, we wonder, oh, philosophy, what is Arif, that? Sir? Yeah. Uh, Arif, sir, we are running out of the show. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm almost at the end, you know, yes. just give me yes. one or two minutes. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, the moment you see philosophy, philosophy is out there, you know, in the stratosphere, you know, philosophy is, you know, life, etc. All right. Uh, so media philosophy, philosophy actually has become so, I mean, media theory, which is short term, has, uh, has been supplemented with media philosophies also. And there are a lot of approaches to engage with this, like the way you have film studies, but you also have something called film philosophy. And the way you use this and that is completely different, and, you know. So all these changes probably, I think, you know, we can, you know, reflect on and uh, possibly look at, you know, um, how um, one could uh, um, uh, yeah, integrate, um, you know, uh, this. Because as said, Times Now, I would go there only to understand what is not journalism. I certainly will not go to Times Now to learn what is, you know, um, uh, journalism. Plus, um, I think, you know, in the, in the media philosophy, when you learn, you also understand that form and content are completely like, you know, blurring like you know content technology this this distinction is a sort of you know blurring okay so that is uh you know yeah so these are my thoughts uh, which you know random thoughts and so for instance you know when you're studying digital journalism uh, like you know for instance uh, new digital native websites uh you must also study how are they recruiting do they have a fair representation of journalists from different, you know, from, for example, you know, how, how many Dalits are recruited in, 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 in the journalism industry? Or how many women are recruited? Mm -hmm. How many tribal communities, you know, women from tribal communities are recruited, right? How many from poor and, you know, richer background? So if you want only people from Oxford University to come to, you know, work in this thing, then how are you going to represent? So, I mean, news organizations like ProPublica, you know, for instance, you know, is putting up a list of like, you know, who are the people they recruit? They recruit I mean, from different, like, you know, disabled people, uh, LGBTQ community and stuff like that, right? So I think these sensitizations should also happen as we are studying about digital, you know, media organizations, as we are studying platforms, you know, and I should also study platform labor, Swiggy and people working for Swiggy, Uber and drivers working for Uber and how are they actually rated, right? I mean, there are a lot of things, you know, I, I don't have time to discuss that. Or Amazon Turk might look like as if, oh, it's giving a lot of opportunities to people, but how do they exploit, you know? So people talk about computational capitalism, communicative capitalism, digital capitalism, surveillance capitalism. I think, you know, on the critical side, I think at the master's level, there is a need for us, you know, to teach our students along with the technical side, these aspects also. Together as a package, they will go out 
as responsible, socially responsible, highly discerning students. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the uh, marathon thing, and it was very interesting to hear where you spoke a lot about uh, how things has been, and especially with uh, uh, the westernization of the syllabi and how it has been still been on influence when it comes to Indian, and how we need to get more localized. Okay, that uh, refocusing on the local culture and the local kind of work, the kind of research which needs to be taken about Sarvadan works and all, and how the family religion. Community dynamics are still playing a very important role, and how uh, journalism education can rethink about this, and we need to revisit. At the same time, we are also supposed to think about <coughs> new emerging trends. It can be related to data, it can be related to coding. So keeping all these things in mind, and also keeping the students, because that is what the NEP also speaks about. It mainly speaks about uh, having the things or having the syllabus or the education which are student centric. At the same time, how well we can make the study or the education more enjoyable. So that is also thing, and also it's work more on the critical thinking. Yes, we it's a high time that we people, especially the media educators who are here, have to rethink about it, and we need to introspect. I think there are a lot of things which has been opened up by your talks, which uh, which was not at all even in the thoughts sometimes of being in the media educate uh, media education for such a long time. Thank you, Hani, for such yeah, a insight, you. and also you have given a lot of food for thought for all of us to. Think about it. Thank you, Thank uh, Anil. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you. So, are, is there any questions uh, from the audience, uh, from the attendees who wants to know any? You can just specify the question and you can pose it directly to the speakers or the panelists. Uh, am I audible, madam? I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. Go ahead. I uh, first of all, I would like to thank. For providing such a wonderful platform for all these eminent personalities and come and talk, but that is an injustice also because all the participants are worth listening to.